really it's about change, about how do you affect change? And I think that in order to do that, I, I would recommend getting a really good understanding of um, how you know, societies form and you know, like understand some sociology, understand something about economics um, and, and obviously philosophy as well. But I, you know, that sounds pretty dry, I guess, if you know, to a gender listen, oh, really? But, but you know, it wasn't until I started looking at those things that I began to understand you know, how this all works, how it fits together. Because I think that this, you know, you really, I think it really, it's important to understand what, syst what we mean by a system and what we mean by structure and structural change and structural reform. And until, I think until you get to grips with that, you end up going down lots of, of um, you know, blind alleys. <laughs> Graham Brown Martin is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas with Mark Buckley, um, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Graham founded Learning Without Frontiers, LWF, a global community bringing together renowned educators, technologists, and creatives to share provocative and challenging ideas about the future of learning. His book, Learning Reimagined, a study of global education, geopolitics, produced for the World Innovation Summit for Education, WISE, was published by Bloomsbury in 2015. Graham is the founder of Beyond Tomorrow Global, a growing international intelligence network of interdisciplinary thinkers designing a, a blueprint for society to thrive beyond the 22nd century. He is co-founder of Regenerative Global, a transformative learning consultancy based in London and New York using circular economy principles to inform, innovate learning and design practices. A sought after and popular keynote speaker Graham has in recent years given evidence to the House of Lords Select Committee on Artificial Intelligence, created an agile learning experience for senior leaders of the FTSE 100 Financial Services Company, designed a science program for primary school children using the Internet of Things, created an ex experiential program for children to learn about working with autonomous humanoid robots and was retained by an educational technology maker to lead their product and brand development, education and communication strategies with teams in the UK, US and China. A little quote or saying by uh, someone who uh, recently left us and is very dear to, to both of our hearts, given the nature of global change transforming education around the world is one of the deepest, most ur urgent challenges we now face. With his open but penetrating gaze, Graham Brown Martin is an ideal guide through the complex terrain of ideas and innovations that might just create the new form of education that we really need. That was Sir Ken Robinson, who left us August 21st, uh, the day before Earth Overshoot Day. And uh, he, you and he had uh, many paths crossing. And um, I know you, you worked on probably the book and some other projects together as well. Um, I'm very saddened to see him gone, especially for something like cancer and, and during this pandemic time. But I believe he's left things in good hands with you and many other great leaders and people that he's inspired to continue the work. Um, welcome to the show on a somber note, but we will we'll take it to much higher elevations throughout. But I, 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 I thought it was very fitting that we, we honor him and also uh, kind of discuss a little bit um, what he brought to you, what brought to the world and, and how you were doing this before and, and during and, and, and know him, but uh, kind of 
Did I leave anything out in your biography, anything that you would like to address? I know I could go on forever, but I think it's important our viewers and listeners hear about that. Um, I mean, thank you for that, that, that lovely introduction. I mean, it, it made me sound very important indeed. Um, and, and so I sort of feel myself like I'm blushing really. I mean, it's, it just that makes me sound like I know what I'm talking about. Um, so thank you. No, there's other, I mean, you know, it, it's, um, it's, thank you. I'm, I'm delighted to be here, Mark. And, and thank you for inviting me to the show. I feel honored. You're, you're most welcome. And, and uh, you, you, sh you should feel honored because your bio is probably a lot longer. You do deserve any one of those accolades and you've done a lot for the world of education and uh, raising awareness, empowering women and girls and people and um, changing our our paradigm and a lot of respects on how we look at the world, how we see solving some of these global grand challenges. Um, can, can, can you give us, a, uh, and, and, and this is, uh, I don't wanna to dwell too much on um, uh, Sir Ken at all, but um, can you tell us kind of how you guys met, what you guys collaborated on and, and um, <clears throat> what during this, this other depressing time of a pandemic and other world turmoil that, that we now uh, lost him, how that maybe has affected you or changed your vision or your determination to move forward in other ways? Um, yeah, of course. I mean, I, I, you know, like, like uh, many, many of us, I mean, it's, it's, I was very sad um, to learn of his passing, um, but it did make me reflect um, on you know, on, on Sir Ken and, and what he had achieved um, and, you know, how it affected, you know, my practice and, and my interests um, with that. Of course, <clears throat> you know, Ken has, has passed, but he's still with us and will be with us, um, you know, for the, you know, for, for a long time because, you know, his legacy, I think, was, was, was starting a revolution. You know, he... I mean, he's best known, of course, for his, his talks around creativity and, and innovation and, you know, the transformation of our education system to accommodate those things for very good reason. One for individual and personal well-being, but more importantly, for the well-being of society. You know, I think that, you know, he, in, in many ways, there was much more that he was talking about as well. I mean, you know, we, our involvement really was um, not so much Collaborative collaboration, but more than uh, through Learning Without Frontiers, you know, that was probably all uh, 15 years ago that, that we, we pr came properly into each other's orbit um, and giving talks and so forth. But then as, as that developed, you know, we developed a friendship and, um, you know, we would meet occasionally if he was in London or if I was in Los Angeles, um, we, we would meet up, have lunch and, and shoot the breeze and, and, and see what's going on. I found those conversations really, you know, the inspiring. Um, but, you know, he, he was looking at the, not, not just the, you know, in addition to that subject of innovation and creativity, but also the, the, the mechanics of the educational, you know, structure. And, and you know, <clears throat> the, the idea of these, uh, these, these assessments and examinations, which are just, you know, pointless really. But, but he would recognize the business model in that and i think that you know i think there were other things that he would have liked to have talked about but i think everyone wanted that creativity talk which is which is fine because that's a sort of a that's what he'll be remembered for and i think that's a good thing to be remembered for and i but it's it's you know it strikes me that many people have been having this conversation about creativity and innovation i mean you can go you know before um so ken i mean to john dewey and and so forth so this is a conversation which has been going on for a very long time and yet here we are you know there's uh, I, I was talking to some people the other day about you know going back to school because of the pandemic you know parents have had their children you know being homeschooled or, or having online teaching because there's very little online learning going on it's all online teaching you know, the schools were thinking, okay, we're going to digitize and virtualize a classroom and then give it to you via a screen. So it's had the same kind of limitations. And of course, what was happening there is difficult to contain. And so young people would be going off and doing some actual learning that they were passionate about. But parents were also noticing that what those, what their children were learning and 
were being tested for was the same as what they were learning and were tested for when they went to school. And their parents and their grandparents. And yet, you know, the world nearly has nearly 8 billion people on it. We've had, you know, we're, we're transitioning to um, AI and automation. You know, we're having major climatic events and a global pandemic. What is it that we're sending our kids to school? And it's funny, we're rushing into this new normal. You know, the, but it's, not, it's the old normal. You know, kids going back to school with masks and everything else, but we're still going to do the same thing. It's like a, like a mad computer system that's gone wrong. It's like, it's like it's just continuing. It's like it doesn't recognize what's outside. And that's what Ken, I think, was, was recognizing. And, you know, it was nice, great, fantastic to see the outpouring you know, on social media, on LinkedIn, everywhere, you know, everyone had something nice to say about, about Ken, and rightly so. But what are we going to do about it, exactly. is my point. I mean, 60 million people viewed his TED Talk. 60 million people who would have been touched by that. And believe, I mean, how many people have we heard who come up to us and say, oh, it inspired me. What if it inspired you? Do something. We're not, you know, we're still, you know, it's like, yes, it, yes, that creativity, Ken Robinson, yeah, but we're still going to go back to the old thing. You know, I mean, surely, I mean, surely, I mean, the pandemic, I mean, you know, you and I both know, you know, the, the, the bigger picture on climatic change, and that's really the big one. You know, yeah. we know about air pollution killing 7 million people every year, yeah. but it's not on your doorstep. And if it's not on your doorstep, hmm, you know, it's happening to those Africans or those Indians, it's not really happening to us. Which is, which is appalling, but it's also kind of how we operate, you know, in society. And I think that has to change. The it's pandemic... almost that e evolutionary. So if we see a lion, a tiger, a bear or something, we're like, okay, we've got to react. We've got to get away. We've got to flee. We've got to do something. But then if, if we're presented with another graph or a chart, we're like, okay, climate change is growing exponentially. Here's a graph here, you know, IPC report that's 200 pages, 3000 pages, whatever, uh, says this, that we're doomed and gloom. They're like, oh, another report. You know, there's, there's not that flight or fight or action. Uh, you know, it's great to hear a TED talk. I, I love this TED talk as well. Um, but how do we put that into action? How do we not get overwhelmed with this existential thing and say, hey, here, here, here's how we put it into action. Um, that, that's a rabbit hole you're almost getting down into right, right off the bat. And I, and, and I want to get, I mean, we're going to go into some because uh, uh, there, there's so much we need to catch up on. It's been years yeah. since we've seen each other. But uh, I, I do want to tickle that. Is that a, a civil, civilization framework? This, the system's not working for us anymore. We're just, it's Einstein's problem theory. We're just continuing to repeat the same, use the same thinking to, to you know, with the same yeah. problems instead of thinking a little bit different or, or yeah. what use or thoughts. Yeah. So it's fabulous that you, 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 you asked that and mentioned that. Um, so let me, a very short story. I'll try to keep it short. No so problem. Please. I, I had this epiphany um, at the end of last year. You know, I mean, I, I, I've been spending a lot of my career, you know, flying around the world, I'm ashamed to say now, giving keynotes, you know, trying to get this message across. I mean, because it was all, what I was doing was, you know, bringing together, you know, people seem to know me from the education perspective, but, you know, different phases of my life. I've done entertainment and technology and economics and, and so forth. And what my talks really are bringing those together and joining the dots between these disparate interdisciplinary subjects. It's part of how my brain works. Uh, to try and get people to, to have this conversation. But anyway, I was in Malaysia to give a talk to about, uh, I think it was like 4,000 uh, educators uh, from, from around the region. And, um, you know, it was great fun, obviously, and everything else. And it was this one particular day in the morning, I was, I was you know, out having breakfast. It was beautiful sunshine. You know, you know how beautiful Malaysia can be. Um, and then all of a sudden, it went, went, went dark. You know, and then the storm came in and it was it suddenly you had to, everyone had to be in their rooms. And it was just, you know, the, 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 the rain that was coming down the wind and I was looking out of my window and I had this really lovely room and I'm looking out and I'm seeing the storm drains going out into the sea. The evening before I'd been no noticed all these 
um, plastic bottles, drinking water bottles that were in the storm, you know, in the sort of the, 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 those ditches. But then I could see all these bottles coming out of the storm drain and, then the, and, and everything else. And, and in, it's kind of almost poetic because I was then reading the New York Times, um, which were reporting some information which I, I knew but had, hadn't been published, which was um, where I was sitting and, and, and a lot of places in that region would be underwater. In, in 30 years time, maybe sooner, you know, along with, um, you know, parts of Egypt and, 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 and you know, it's, it's, it, it's hard. But then I was sort of sitting there thinking, wow, I mean, okay, this was monsoon, but I get the sense of what it might be like. I mean, probably worse than that in a, in a major climate. This is yet to come. We know it's yet to come. So I'm thinking, well, Gosh, I'm, I'm keep giving this talk, I'm giving the same talk, really, in different varieties of different forms for ages. But it's not, it's not landing. Everyone's agreeing with me, but not, not doing anything. I mean, this is, I guess, Ken's frustration must have been like this as well. I like, was feeling that. I'm not, not trying to put myself on the same level, but it was just, you know, and then, you know, then all of a sudden, epiphany, the penny dropped. You know, I, I, I'd failed to link things, in, but then it dropped, and as I just realised that. You know, for a long time, you know, to give, give my talks to educators, you know, I would say that, well, the purpose, what is the purpose of education? You know, I would say, is it to produce human capital for the economic development plan? And that sounds horrible, doesn't it? People as yeah, human yeah, capital, yeah. right? Or I would say, is it to equip present and future generations with the skills and knowledge to thrive um, in, a, in a rapidly changing world? And of course, you know, I was really big on that last one, you know, because everyone, everyone agrees with that, right? Yeah. But then it occurred to me that I was wrong. The answer to the purpose of education, I'm not talking about learning, I'm talking about education, you know, the, the, the system of education, the structure of education is to provide human capital for the economic development plan. There's no arguing, there's no getting away from it. I mean, you know, look at Singapore and their education system. It was, you know, Lee Kuan Yew, rest in peace, you know, and, and the People's Action Party, I mean, that was all predicated. You know, that he looked at every single structure in order for it to take it from a sort of post-colonial swamp to a major uh, financial services powerhouse was to, to, to use education as a way as developing human capital to fit into that growth plan. And if you look at it, that's the same everywhere on the planet, pretty much in the Western world at least. Um, but then I thought, ah, if we accept that, we accept that as a thing. What happens when the economic, in the, in the global economic model changes? What happens when it shifts? Because that economic model, the one that we're in at the moment, we know it's broken. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's extractive. It's oppressive to the majority of people in the world. You know, if you're not white, if you're not male, it, it's oppressive. If you, you know, it, 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 you know it's structurally violent to them and the planet. So this, so we have this, this is before the pandemic, remember? Um, and I'm sitting there thinking, okay, this is, so why is it gonna shift? What, you know, it's like, you know, cause we have been talking about this for an awful, awful long time. And then it occurred to me that there's a convergence of things happening. You know, we are, you know, we will take climate change and the environment and our one and only home seriously at, at, some, at some point, hopefully soon. Um, and that is a sort of catalyst for a kind of change really. Because actually, I mean, it's like it's bad for business if you've got no, no consumers, I guess. You know, capitalism fails then. But the other thing, of course, is that, you know, we're, we're seeing a, a new generation coming through, you know, Generation Z, you know, there's 2.5 billion of them, you know, the sort of, uh, you know, 10 to 25 year olds. And, you know, like all generations, they have, you know, they, they, they're like teenagers. I mean, you know, you know not fetishizing them, but, you know, like all, all generations, they, 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 have, they, have their, they, they have their agenda. And I think their agenda is to save the planet. You know, and I, you know, you'll sort of look at some of their icons, you know, the obvious ones like Greta Thunberg and Malala, you know, there's a, an environmentalist and there's a, you know, someone that's, that's passionate about education and so forth. And that gives me the optimism, that, 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 that gives me hope. Because 2.5 billion of them is the largest generation of human history. And, you know, they are, they all make the, the decisions that they make, the decisions who they vote for, the decisions about what they buy and how they consume will be pivotal in my opinion in changing that economic model so and i think there have to be some other levers as well but i can see us you know i hope maybe it's idealism you know i have children i have to be optimistic um 
but a transition from this, you know, extractive linear economy that's just based on pulling stuff out of the ground. I mean, it just goes way back, you know, to, you know, just about the Second World War and, and, and you know, the extraction of oil and everything else, because economics is, is the science of studying how we deal with scarcity. That's what it's about. It's how we manage scarcity and it's different plans for how we manage scarcity. It's just a plan. It's designed. And the economic model that we have at the moment is designed with extraction and with the, with, the, with the, you know, resources and everything else. And so, and if you look at that, it permeates throughout our entire world. You know, there's only so many people that can get an A you know, in a school test. There's only so many people that can get this. There's only so many people who can be rich. It's, it's this kind of extraction, 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 but it's designed to be like, and you know, in many respects, it's done us very well. The fact that we're talking to each other, over a video connection and, you know, by food in the fridge and everything else is, is testament to that economic model. What we didn't realize, of course, is that the, the actual um, price isn't in the purchase cost. It's like, you know, it, it would be offsetting all of those things as a result of our economy. And, you know, I'd be prepared to be generous as perhaps, you know, a hundred years ago when this was formed, you know, Hayek, the economist in the US rather than Keynes, you know, but we didn't know. You know, maybe we didn't know that extracting oil and burning it and, and throwing stuff away and all that kind of stuff. Maybe we just didn't know, but we do know now. Can, can that shift? Can we shift? Can we move? And I think actually Gen Z, but it's not just Gen Z, it's obviously who they influence before and after their generation. Can that influence the things that, how we make things, how we design things, how we, the things that we sell? Because I think if you, if you offer like a, you know, it's possible to make products that are regenerative. It's possible to make, to keep the components and the stuff that we extract in, in, in continual use in a circular economy. So, and it doesn't necessarily need to cost more because it's a design issue. I mean, it's like, you know, we've been designing, you know, waste and pollution into our products, you know, so, you know, someone thought it was a good idea that they could glue the battery inside my mobile phone because it makes it all nice and pretty. But it doesn't make it serviceable. It doesn't keep the components in use. And though, you know, Apple, I'm not picking on them, you know, they have a machine that will recycle. But, you know, we all know that a lot of these phones are thrown in a landfill and, and everything yeah. else. And, and, and all that. And, but also the cost of extracting out isn't just the materials, it's also the human cost, you know, the sort of slave labor involved and everything else. But if we could say, like, let's take a white, white goods, you know, we take a, here's a washing machine. Right? That's designed using circular economy principles. It's designed to waste and pollution out. It keeps the materials in. You know, you can wash an entire load of clothes with one, you know, with with a, one point of water, and it turns it, it cleans that water and turns it into drinking or whatever. You, that you understand that kind of yeah. you know, sounds like a magical System device. But we circular, could, yeah. We could do it. Right? So you, here's this one to Jim Z, and here's this one, which is the old way of doing it, which basically you have to change it in five years' time. But don't worry, just throw it in the. It, it, it out of the trash and, 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 and all that kind of the kinds of, you know, I, I think that most people, I mean, the generations that would go for the one that doesn't destroy the planet. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be because at, at that scale with 2.5 billion people, you could build that at scale, you know, so it doesn't, it, it actually costs less because actually this is the point is like you're actually doing these things. Cost less. So I was thinking that could be one of the levers to switch us to a, you know, sort of, I, I know well, it is a lever for for sure. It's an as absolutely is a, a lever, and and you're taking us down so many rabbit holes. We're, oh, I'm so we, sorry. We, we've got, <laughs> no, you don't need to be sorry. We're going to have to put this into two podcasts. This is so fabulous material because we we haven't even really gotten we haven't even tickled the surface yet, and we're already deep in into it. I mean, there you know. Uh, as, as an educator, as an innovator, as a futurist, as somebody who's been doing this for such a long time, um, it's the it's the overview effect. We're all on the same spaceship Earth, and and there is no throwaway. It all remains here. So somehow it has to be worked back into the system and kept in in a circular process. Otherwise, it comes back to to really affect human health, our environment. Uh, uh, you know, because the the trash does pile up eventually. You know, if it's not done in, in that that method. So, I'm in full alignment with you, and also you address that the the system's not working for us anymore. This the whether it's the economy, 
<clears throat> capitalism, whether it's um, whether it's uh, the, the the nationalistic models of, of economy that are out there, they're just not working for us anymore. Uh, what our listeners don't know is we've known each other for a little while. We haven't had too much time to to really interact with each other over the the years, except for online uh, cordialities and keeping in touch with each other. But uh, we, we met through Kinternet and and have. Um, tried to you know stalk each other online i follow you avidly because when when i heard you speak back then and got to know you i, I just was absolutely fascinated not only with the way your mind works the way you see the big system the, the complexity of the, uh, the way our world works and the systems of and how education ties into all of that as well as innovation you know keeping up with our exponentially growing world this innovation um because you've doing, been doing this for so long, there's a certain amount of not only knowledge, but resilience into your life that you, you, you've been talking about. You've been preaching, evangelizing, and trying to educate people about it for a while. But I presume, and, but I, I really know, that you've applied a lot of these things into your own life. And you've, you've done it because you you want to also try to empower people to apply it and change the system and apply it into their lives. Has any of that helped you to weather this pandemic, this hard time, not only with the, the pandemic, but Black Lives Matters, Beirut, uh, what's going on, you know, Hurricane Laura and many of the other turmoils, these things where we're saying, oh my God, are we facing a collapse? Is, is the whole system falling apart, you know? Um, has that helped you weather this time, that knowledge, that experience? I, I think, yes. I mean, it, it, it's, it's given me a, a sort of perspective on what's happening at the moment. And I think that perspective gives me a sort of a sense of, of resilience, but it's also a, a sense of frustration. You know, the point I was saying about earlier about the, um, you know, the, what, what education's role is. Um, and it, it, it follows, you know, the, the, the economy, the economic model, because the economic model is our, that, that really forms our beliefs. It, it becomes our consciousness in the way because the structures that are, that are supporting that, that model, you know, education is one of them, religion is another, mass media is another, the political system is another, and the judicial system is another. And I think that, that being able to look at that and understand that clearly you know, that, that's what you're talking about. When people are talking about systems, and you know, for example, when they talk about systemic racism or structural racism, what they're talking about is this system and these structures. I mean, this is, you know, well known, I mean, in terms of sociology and, and uh, but also in the economics. I mean, you know, quite often when you talk about that, you get accused of being a Marxist. Yeah. Um, which is, there's worse things to be. Accused there's a lot of worse things. But, but, you know, it's important to realize that Karl Marx was an economist. Um, and it was just another economic model that he was putting forward. I mean, you know, theoretical or otherwise. I mean, it, it's sort of a, a conflating that with authoritarian leaders that in time, you know, use that to create versions of communism is, is in, in, incorrect. Um, but he, you know, he was talking about different ways of, of managing this. And so it's really interesting, Mark, that, that you know, we're seeing a number of things happening. You know, the, the, a number of movements are at, at a zenith, you know, Black Lives Matter, the LGBTQ plus movement, the feminist Me Too movement, the environmental movement, they're all having a zenith during a global pandemic. Now, I don't think that's a coincidence. You know, I think that's a consequence, a consequence of the current system that we're in. And it's very hard to imagine a different system. It's like, you know, telling a goldfish doesn't really see the water. You know, you change it, you can't imagine what that might be like. So I can imagine what, the, what, what, what new really means. Um, but the point is about those movements is that actually they all demand, quite rightly, the same thing. You know, a, a different operating system, you know, a different global economic model which shapes our beliefs and values and conduct so that it isn't oppressive and, and includes, you know, those populations, 
that is designed because that's what economies are designed for people and planet and, and profit fine i mean it's not it, it, this idea that it's somehow anti-capitalist is, is complete nonsense because the version of capitalism we have at the moment is designed to support this current system which we know is oppressive which we know is destroying the planet you know it's not not, not we have a choice about changing it i mean yeah. you know it depends on when we change it because you know it, it, this can't be this can't be a, a game where you win by being the last person on the planet with the last glass of water i mean that's insane so yeah. when we look at those movements you know then this is the, the point about the resilience is understanding that they're connected now the the frustration i've been having during this lockdown and everything else is having those conversations and trying to encourage people to see the system you know just in a way dispassionately but to see how those movements blm lgbtq plus me too feminism environment how, how all, all of them are connected you know there is a sort of divide and conquer which kind of works which is actually you know let's not let, let them combine but if you actually combine them you know, that's, that's the majority of the planet, right? I mean, it's it's because yeah. the, the, the system that we have at the moment is being optimized um, for uh, straight white men. I mean, I don't say that as any sort of self-hating straight white man. Yeah. But it, it, it just is. It's just a fact. I mean, you can see it. In, in, you know, the things that have been revealed, I mean, the, the issues around statues, for example, I mean, it's ridiculous kind of, you know, sort of, nostalgia and 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 feeling of something for a inanimate object which is representative of a system which has been optimized for only a very small narrow population on the planet it is revealing and so actually why are these organizations getting pushback from you know the authoritarian rulers of that system why is greta thunberg being you know treated with disdain um, by presidents, um, by the president, you know, a president's followers and, and so forth. Why? Why is the, are women told to mind their tone, um, you know, when they're merely stating a view which is different to, 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 to the, an opposing view? You know, how can being an anti-racist be declared that you are a extreme far left Marxist. How did that happen? How did wearing a mask in a global pandemic become a left wing? It, 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 this is polarization. It's crazy, but it, yeah, it, yeah. I think it's because it's you know, and actually Marx did write on this. I mean, when the, the economy, which is society's foundation, the base, that's that's how we manage the resources on the planet. When that comes under attack, to change to support other people, to invite other people in, to include them. So we don't have this, you know, th this kind of society, the structures, you know, the education structure, the religion, everything else, you know, judicial police, pol political and so forth, will then suddenly come to stabilize that. And it's, it, it's, it's not, it does not necessarily deliberate. It's not unconscious of how societies work. And I think that's the thing was to, to try and understand that. And, you know, it's interesting because you know, I was having conversations with people in the Black Lives Matter movement. They talk about structural racism. I said, "Well, you know, can you explain that in terms of what those structures are?" And then the conversation stopped because it hadn't been understood. You know, it was a, it was a term, structural racism or structural oppression or systemic racism, but it, it wasn't fully understood by a lot of people. I mean, obviously not everyone, but I mean, it's, it's a lot of people that didn't, didn't really understand it. And, and I think that's important because once we understand that, it gives us the opportunity to change. Now. The, pro the challenge there is that if we look at history, and history can tell us what's happening now, I believe, is that the only way that we've managed to do that sort of structural reform you know, is, is through three particular ways, uh, war, uh, revolution, or catastrophe. Now, one could argue that we're heading for all three at the moment. The problem with all of those is that it require, you know, it, it involves the, 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 the death of you know, millions of people and destruction to the planet. And it's like, we, we must avoid that, um, you know. And if we go back in time, I mean, during, you know, when the last time this happened, the last time there was a structural reform, you know, in the 1920s, there was a social political theorist called Antonio Gramsci. 
um, who was imprisoned under Mussolini. Um, and, you know, he wrote some amazing things. I recommend, you know, the, the listeners to just sort of tap into Gramsci. Um, but one of the things he said, and I'm, I'm going to misquote this, but I'll try and get the gist, gist of it. He said that, the, the, this is the late 1920s, he said that, you know, we are, you know, it's because we are in this interregnum, they call it, it was Latin for interruption. They normally use it when the Pope changes, it's time in between. Um, during this interregnum, because the old has not yet died, therefore the new cannot be born. During this time, morbid symptoms will appear. And that was describing what was happening in Europe and America and everywhere, you know, the planetary thing. But he was describing this sort of, uh, that, at that time, this swift, this movement to the populist uh, right wing, you know, this kind of view. Is, so, and, and German and Italian expansionism, you know, and of course they were in a long line of other European expansionists. I mean, I mean you know, Europe, Europe expanded. The best. But so during that time, he was talking about morbid symptoms, but it's important to understand what he was saying was because when he said the old, he meant the status quo. Business and, and, as usual. Yeah. And the new, he, the new happens, it's going to happen, you know, but we don't know what it is and, it, and it's, it, it's struggling to burst through, but it can't because the gatekeepers of the old are still in control because they, they get into the control situation because you've benefited from them. You know, it's as like why when you go to, to most corporations in the world, you see a white man, you know, this is how that's designed. Um, but change will happen. And I think that, you know, back to the point about how, you know, the resilience, how do we get to the other side? And what is occupying my mind is how we get to the new without destruction of people or planet. How do we, you know, mitigate that? Um, because we have to get to the new. And I think the, the, the biggest challenge that we have at the moment is that we are constantly looking at what's happening right now. You know, we wake up in the morning, we look at the, you know, whatever news source that we do with it, social media or otherwise, we go, oh, what has, that, what has that politician done now? What have they said? How outrageous that is. I mean, this is, you know, it, as we know, over the last 10 years, it's got worse and worse and worse. I mean, there's nothing that could happen from, you know, from some of these governments that would surprise you anymore. And it's, you know, it's a dead cat uh, strategy. You know, it's like, the, you know, when there's something else happening, you throw a dead cat onto the table. And everyone goes, oh, there's a dead cat. And, and forget all the other things they're talking about. And the thing is, we are, as a, as a global society, falling for that. You know, it's like, as soon as something else is going on over here, say something crazy. Say something about the military. Uh, you know, say something, you know, the, it, it, we know these stories that are going on. But I caution us, is if we continue to look at that stuff and ignore designing where we want to go, and thinking about where we want to go and designing the next global economic system, we will get what we're given. We will have to accept it. And at the moment, you know, it's looking like authoritarian um, you know, rule. You know, it doesn't, you know, the, we're yeah. talking about it going to something, you know, beautiful, something dictatorship, like something, authoritarian you know. rule. We're also, yeah. I agree with you totally, we're getting distracted with this you know, the cat that's thrown on the table, we're getting distracted with the fake news or saying, no, it's all about just this one facet. No, it's, it's much more complex. And education uh, and intelligence really uh, ties deeply into that. I see it, and you, you can correct me if maybe I'm wrong. I'm glad that you brought up these recent examples um, where we've had some some changes, some different uh, uh, shifts, but it's this big history, you know, this big history of our world about about, about what has happened. That I'm, I'm I don't know if I'm worried, but I'm I wonder if the educational system or the Gen Z, who are really vital in this role, are getting that correct information of the big history, like. <clears throat> I'll give you a couple of examples, and, and you mentioned one as well that was more recent. We've had um, more than 12 civilization framework collapses, early Mesopotamia, early antiquity, Incas, Aztec, Mayas, Greeks, uh, Romans, on and on. And as you also said, the majority of them, all, all but two, and you, you're well more versed than, than I am, uh, fell because of an ecological environmental collapse 
and all we have left now are, are the ruins of those and, and some a little little fragments of cultural history uh, left. But mainly today we're going out on vacation and taking a selfie, a, a photo, you know, of the ruins, but we're not understanding the big picture of what that truly means. And then the two that weren't a ecological or environmental collapse were some kind of a conflict or 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 other type of of collapse. And I personally uh, feel we're also this unease, this that we're in the midst of, you know, a lot of bad decisions, a lot of nationalism, a lot of uh, culmination of things coming together. Um, that we we need to to keep this bad system, this global bad system afloat or spin the plate while we somehow transition to something new. Um, you know that I'm an advocate for the sustainable development goals, and um, I speak about them a lot, and I'd love to get your views or opinions. Uh, there's a few things. One, it's the first ever global moonshot. It's a historical precedence. 197 countries came together for the first time ever and decided on a global action plan to December 2030 uh, and the Paris Agreement. The Sustainable Development Goals were done before in September 24th and then P the Paris Agreement came a, a little bit later in December um, uh, where we agreed that we wouldn't, uh, we would cap the warming at 1.5 and not go um, not go above that. Um, I believe not only is that a historical precedence, but all nations at one point or another, whether they understood the full plan or not, agreed that that's the roadmap and the plan that we should take, the future that we that we want to reach. But what they didn't understand, one, they didn't present it to humanity properly. They didn't educate us on how to view them, how to understand them. But the the the, the biggest misunderstanding is that it is a brand new, total new operating system. There's not going back to business as usual. It's not a tweak on business as usual. It's not even a modification. It is a total new global economy, total new level of setting the operating standard globally at a much higher level and saying as a world, we can still have dictators and crazies and systems and nations but we're all going to say that we're never going to let humanity get under this level ever again. And there's still going to be mistakes and crazies and things, but it's just that we're saying never again below this level. And it's kind of a new operating system, not only innovation, digitization, economies, gender equality, no poverty, no hunger, on and on. These, this new infrastructure is what, what it will provide us. Um, but hell, it, it just seems like, you know, did we understand that? Do we understand that it's really a, a new, a new, a new hope, a new shift? The quality education, I think, is number four on the sustainable uh, yeah, development goals, which which is so vital to educate us even what it means. But not only that, to change the entire system we've been working on, which I think it changed. And so I would love to hear your thoughts and feelings in this because what not only we're we're talking about you know circular economy regenerative what what new models are out there could the sustainable development goals could the paris agreement even though we're we probably strayed away from it or not unified on it as we should be could that be a solution what are your thoughts yeah, i mean it's 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 a it's a it's an interesting question and, and it's one that comes up quite a bit actually um and I'm going to try and pull a few of those strands together because you, you mentioned like Gen yeah. Z and are they getting the right information or all this kind of business, which I think is a very important question. Um, and then, you know, the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals and SDG 4, of course, education. And then the idea that education, if we do get education right, then we can change society. So I'll, I'll start with the, the end one and, sure. and then work my way back. So the, if we change education, will it change society? No. It's, it won't. And the, and the reason why I, I'm, I'm definite about that, you know, this is this back to the, the point I was making earlier and, and also Ken Robinson and, and many, many others, you know, been having this conversation about, you know, no one will disagree um, that we need an education system that is going to uh, allow our children to thrive. 
you know, when I, when I did the book, I, I, I traveled, you know, it must have been five times around the planet. Sorry, climate, everything else, though, you know. But it was to visit people in everywhere. You know, I went into, you know, refugee camps on the Syrian border, um, you know, to California in the offices of Google. I mean, it was like, you know, up a mountain in China after an earthquake. I mean, just looking to put, but all around the world, talking to different you know, children, parents, um, teachers, thought leaders, you know, people like Chomsky and Ken and, and all that kind of thing, you know. What came out of that was a, a sort of common theme. Doesn't matter where they were, parents just wanted their children to thrive. That's a universal norm. That's a universal norm. And so no one would, would, would disagree that that's what edu you know, education should equip, but, but it doesn't. What does education do? And this is to answer your, your, your Gen Z question about education is, is it's, um, you know, I mean, it is a, is a cultural reproduction system. Um, you know, it's, it's, we had a thing here in the UK, in England, just recently, um, where because uh, we had to cancel the examinations that 16 year old and 18 year olds had, you know, the, the ones that will let you get into a university and so forth, they weren't able to take those tests because of, you know, the pandemic. And yet, you know, even though there was a pandemic, universities were adhering to this, you know, this gatekeeping model. Um, and so what the, what the English, you know, what they did in England and Wales was the, the Department for Education decided to uh, write an algorithm um, that would determine what grades these young people would have, would have received. Which, which kind of, you know, if you say it quickly, sounds like a cool idea, right? It's like, you know, you, you, would, you would take into account everything you've done and where you go to school and what your background is and everything else. And of course, they, the, the algorithm did exactly what it should do. But in doing so, it exposed the structural inequalities in the system in that, you know, if you came from a you know, particular kind of background and you went to a you know, highly paid independent private school and everything else, then you got these grades. If you went to a, you know, if you were you in, a, in, a, in a less affluent area, in a, you know, in a, in a, in a poorly performing school perhaps, or, or whatever, you would be, you would get downgraded. And so what, what it did was really, I mean, people got very upset about the algorithm and everything else, but they didn't fail to grasp that that's, that's, that's how our system works. I mean, yeah. it's just, you know, it's a bit like the, um, you know, Google, the search engine. I mean, if you put it in there, you know, criminal or whatever, it will pick up certain kinds of you know, stereotypes, which are actually not true, but it reflects our society. And so bringing those in closely, I mean, I, you know, I think it's, you know, it's strange, isn't it, that, you know, the things that, you know, we have, we have subjects that are compulsory in, in, in English. You have to, you know, like maths, English. I mean, as well as you can understand. But philosophy, economics, sociology, these are regarded as kind of, well, particularly sociology, for example, and political science, regarded as sort of a, you know, or media studies even. It's like, oh, it's a silly subject. It's not worth very much. But how, how can the study of how societies evolve? And, and, you know, imagine being, when you're armed with that knowledge, and then you have to kind of think that, you know, maybe that's a plan. Maybe, maybe you don't really want people to be uh, aware and active and active participants in their democracy. Because, you know, you can't have a democracy if you don't have, you know, informed people. You know, so, and, and it's interesting to look at the statistics at the moment in, the, in terms of voting behavior. Used to, voting behavior used to be um, socioeconomic you know, background. You know, if you were one particular socioeconomic group, you would vote this way. And if you were another one, you'd vote the other. That's not the case anymore. You know, the case, um, the, 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 the key indicators of voting behavior now are age, back, you know, race, and education. And it turns out that if you know, you're not, not particularly well educated and you're this particular type and this background, you will vote to, the, to, the, to, to, to populist parties. And there's lots of, you know, we, we, it's another rabbit hole that we could go down. Um, but, you know, in, in terms of how marginalized um, societies, even when the, you know, in, indigenous societies are then politicized and weaponized and, and so forth. So I don't think that you know, in the education system, when I say education, not learning, I mean, learning and education is, is they're not the same thing. Um, I don't think that Gen Z are getting it from there. Where they are getting it from, though, and I can contest it, is I have a 14-year-old daughter who I'm very proud of. Uh, she's dual heritage, her mother's Ghanaian, and she's been activated 
during this time off. She couldn't be, in, she also couldn't be less interested in what the school was sending her. In fact, she ignored all of it. But she got activated by the Black Lives Matter movement. And then as a result of that started researching her own research about things, started learning sociology and learning about politics and economic models and everything else is 14. Not, you know, never been interested in these kinds of things before. And she was getting this from TikTok. You know, and this is Gen Z, they live in TikTok and it's not all, you know, I mean, there's some funny stuff on there and, and all that stuff, but there's also some very cool stuff. And that generation talking about these issues and that encouraged her because that inflamed her passion to go and find out more. And I, 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 I kid you not, I, you know, I've worked with Noam Chomsky and I, you know, he's one of my heroes. She would be able to have a conversation with him and, and hold her position very, very well. I mean, I'm sure they would be you know, violently in agreement with each other. And I think that's interesting. I mean, that's really online learning, you know, but, but, but you know, I mean, you know, I, I Donald agree. Trump, for example, also shot TikTok down. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, all kinds of reasons for that. But so I, I, I kind of, I still, I still remain optimistic. And then back to this point then about education changing um, society. The problem with that, of course, is that like the SDGs, which sound wonderful, they are responding to that existing framework. You know, if that framework, you know, that global economic model, wasn't like it was we wouldn't need the SDGs. You know, the fact that we need them is a testament to how broken our world is because poverty is man-made. It's not natural. You know, it's an it's a, it's a outcome, it's a consequence of that global economic world. Now, it's, it's, it's laudable, it's wonderful that we, un, we can see the inequalities in society and then we want to get all the countries to agree to make it a little bit better. But it's not looking at the real cause of the problem. It's maybe treating some symptoms. Not, you know, I mean, you can treat the symptoms of cancer, but you're going to die if you don't treat the cancer. And the cancer is the global economic model. And the problem with the SDG 4s, of course, is they're forced to operate within that model. And there's a consequence, you mentioned, you mentioned SDG 4. The consequence of that is that the, they are being rapidly privatized. Because in the, you know in the, in the, the global model and is 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 a neo you know some sort of neoliberalism it's free markets and everything else and then as a consequence of that you know you're seeing the the SDG fours going through that prism that lens and don't get me wrong I'm I'm absolutely supportive of these things I, I actually of course I agree you know I mean the SDG four which I know most about you know the the issues around every child should have access to you know, quality and equitable learning. But what's happening there is you've got, for example, on the African continent, you know, you've got corporations there, you know, for-profit corporations going in and, you know, providing what they call affordable learning, you know, but it's private, you know, and it's, it's essentially profiting from the, from the bottom of the pyramid. You know, so it doesn't really matter, you know, if you, if you, you know, you're living on subsistence or you're, you know, you're, you make your money from selling a crate of tomatoes on your head every day. Um, you know, you look at, you know, they want, like all parents, they, you want your, your children to do well. And so then, so then hand over maybe, you know, it, you know, it sounds in the West sounds like good value, like $20 US dollars per month to put your child through a school. But that's, that's a lot of money. To, to a lot of families. And so therefore not every child can go, but what, that, what these do, I mean, there's one um, provider called Bridge International Academies. They have like you know, many hundreds of schools, particularly in Kenya and Uganda, and I think they're opening up in India. Um, this is a company which is commercial. It's registered in Delaware, where, you know, obviously tax arrangement there. It has investment from um, Bill Gates. It has investment from Mark Zuckerberg. Um, it has investment from the World Bank and from Difford and everything else. And what it does is it, it uses uh, technology to deliver um, scripted lessons that a, a, you know, a, a non-qualified teacher uh, will read to a classroom. And it, and it actually says everything on this cheap tablet, you know, even to tell them when to rub the board. You know, this is a very narrow version of education. And, and you know, when I've spoken to this before, uh, people, you know, people in the West, you know, in, in, in influential people will say, well, 
what kind of education were they getting before? And of course they weren't. They weren't so surely anything. that's better, yeah. but it's not, it's not better. Um, you know, it's a sort of educational colonialism. Um, it's actually impoverishing their education. It's not allowing, because the real issue is in SGG4 isn't about privatizing it. That's not, you know, that's a, that's a perverse, cynical attack on SGG4. It's not developing local expertise. You know, there are challenges on the African continent. You know, in the global south, there are challenges because of our system. But they're not aiming for that. They're thinking, okay, how can we profit from this? You know, it's like the sort of like, it's basically turning the classroom into Uber. You know, you know when, you go, when you jump inside an Uber car or a Lyft car, um, you know, there's a driver, is being told what to do. By, a, by, a, by an app on a, on a mobile device, you know, and it deals with the engage, you know, interaction between me and the driver, and the, you know, and the driver just follows whatever that machine says. You know, so eventually it's gonna be a self-driving car and it'll take the driver out entirely, but it doesn't have to be particularly skilled. So people think about Uber and they think how profitable that is. And they think, okay, well, wow, why don't we have, you know, given that teachers cost a lot of money to develop and everything else, you know, we have to invest in that, you know, a fraction, by the way, of what we invest in the military. Um, well, we could have a self-driving classroom. Isn't that a great idea? The Uber of education. And that just <laughs> fundamentally misunderstands what learning and teaching is about, even within education. Because what's happened is it's, 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 it's turned what they call education into content distribution. You know, content distribution, and then you know, the inculcation of facts and procedures, and then just vomiting them out at an examination, whether that's in your high school or your university or whatever. And of course, this is a business model, you know, Pearson, you know, the largest education company in the world, the book publisher, its business model is copyrights, okay? Copyrights on all those books. It has no yeah. motivation to make those books free. Yeah. So where they are, you know, that's why they've invested in Bridge is, you know, this is a way, you know, because it's an interesting model you know, it's, it's what we all do. You know, it's amazing. I mean, they sell you the textbooks and they own the examination, the measurement. And it's a kind of closed loop. It's like, you have to remember the textbooks, you like memorize them because we all did that, right? Memorize them because then we own the test to make sure that you have to buy those copyrights in order to pass the test and you have to buy the test as well. You see what's wrong with that picture. I mean, if yeah. that was pharmaceutical injury, big pharma owned the hospitals and paid the doctors and everything else, you know, you could see how that could go wrong. But that's happening in education, particularly as SDG4. And it's an absolute travesty and a scandal um, that, that, that UNESCO and so forth will allow this to happen. In fact, positively engage with it um, to such a degree. So don't get me wrong. I, absolutely believe in the intent and the direction of SDG4. The problem, however, is bigger. It's this, it's the global system. And I, I know that, you know, quite, probably quite white, rightly, listeners to the show will go, yeah, but Graham, how do we change that? How can we change it? Of course, I mean, it's very hard. I mean, we are in the interregnum though. You know, as Gramsci said, we are in the, the interregnum started, you know, climate change is not, 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 you know, it started, we're in it. Yeah, we're you in know, thralls. Yeah. I mean, Australia last year was on fire. Now there's mm. snow. I mean, huh? yeah, yeah not, but not, not, not even uh, last year. It was the beginning of this year before we went into the pandemic. They had released um, their yearly equivalent, equivalent of greenhouse gas emissions and CO2 just through the fires, you know, and we saw obviously the koala bears and the really dramatic issues of what was going on there, the animals and, and what was affected. But they released, you know, uh, triple the amount that they release in one year just in that fire this year. And then we go into the pandemic and we act like this little pause that we've had is going to be a big, uh, a big reset or, or a savior to us. Uh, there's a lot of positives that have come out of it, um, but we need much more. We need to leave the planet better than we found it. We need to clean up. We need to live in this circular economy and this regenerative thinking. That brings me nicely into some other things that you're working on. I have to 
poke fun at you or, or, or tease you a little bit and maybe have you explain. So you have this uh, fabulous book, Learning Reimagined. I never got a copy myself. I've tried to find a copy and buy one, but I don't have 200 euros, 200 pounds, I guess, because it's almost like a university book or it's a hard to get. It's probably out of, out of print. But is there a way to get a, get a PDF version or an online version? Or are you going to go into another copying uh, of it? Yeah, or? I mean, it, it's it's um you know I, I'm I'm as frustrated actually, if not more, because because that comes up a lot. And um, you know, it's a complex situation with 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 the book. I mean, I always wanted there to be a, a, an electronic version. You know, particularly because I mean, you know, the point of how do we get people to access? Uh, the book, you know, I mean, it, it books are even more expensive. I mean, it's perversely, you know, books, are, you know, printed books are much more expensive on the African yeah. continent and so forth than, than they are in, in the Western world. Um, but, but for a variety of reasons that has been done. So the, um, the, the, the organization that commissioned, because this was a very expensive production, I yeah, mean, it yeah. was a, you know, we had a photographic team, we had a video team, um, we were going into some pretty hairy places. Um, you know, the logistics was, you know, the big logistics team to get us around the world and, and, and to make that and, and everything else. And that was, that was funded by the, by the Wise, uh, which is, which is a Qatar foundation. Uh, and I'm very thankful for, for them. Um, but their, their view of it was not to make it, you know, as popular as it was. I mean, it just turned out to be much more popular than, than they had imagined it would be. I mean, they, I think they thought that well, there was one print run and that would be done. What had happened with that was that, um, you know, I did it in a different way. I mean, I, I, I tried to bring, it was funny, it was my little joke really, was to try and rather than, you know, try to make the, the, the analog, this, this artifact as a, as, a, as a portal into a digital world. So the way I was doing it was that as I was going around the world, I was using Instagram and blogging and, and all this kind of stuff. So immediately, so I'd, I'd go in, like, like, for example, have an interview with Chomsky and then I'd release <coughs> some of it online just so people could see and then I would also just to pass ideas around to to the community that were following it and that, that what was happening was is that they were all these people were following this journey and then they were commenting and in a way they were co-creating the book and you know we had like well, you know we've over a million hits on 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 my blog alone during this time and a, and a massive following on Instagram at the time and everything else and Twitter and so forth um, and I remember there was a conversation about <clears throat> how many books we should print. And they, they'd made books before and they hadn't done, they hadn't sold very many. Uh, I mean, you know, maybe a, a few hundred, less than a thousand. <clears throat> and, and so they're using similar numbers. And, I, and, and this was a very different book. And I said, like, you, you're mad, it's crazy. Because, I mean, they'd already been upset about me releasing the book published. Why, why are you releasing stuff? I mean, it's like no one's going to buy the book. And I said, no, no, people are going to buy the book because they've been party to that journey and so forth and so they, you know they went to three runs and then it stopped which is a, a great shame um because there is this demand and then what happened was you know literally as soon as, as soon as the print came out it was sold out i mean it was like just just like you know immediately which was which was you know very gratifying but also frustrating and then what happened was the books then started selling on the kind of the, 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 the aftermarket and so then it was being traded as university prices. I so saw at one point yeah, it was like 1,200 yeah. pounds. And yeah. people were, 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 were either flaming me on social media or writing to me and saying, why are you doing this? And I think, I'm, you know, it was a commission. I didn't, I don't profit yeah. from the sale of books. Um, but, it's a, but I understand the frustration. Um, you know, I've got a couple, I've got, a, I've got a little, I've got a box of a few of them here. So if anyone wants them, contact me and I will send I, you I one. I want one. I want one. I'm telling you now. But it, it, it's, it's, you know, there, there isn't, you know, and I've asked many times, can we do a PDF of this? And I will ask again um, after this show. But it's, it's um, for a variety of reasons, it's not being responded to. Um, on the, on and, the and website, I think I know what the reason is. On the website, learning-reimagine.com, is there a lot of information on there that we could go and get? Or is it just... Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the, the blog actually, I mean, the, the blog has a, a lot of stuff on there. I mean, it's not, not, it's not exhaustive. Uh, of what's in the book but i think what you can do is i mean hit hit the blog and have a wander around there uh, that's sort of learning uh, dash reimagine.com um find me on medium 
because there's a learning reimagined <coughs> publication on medium so just go to medium and tap in learning reimagined you should find it i hope um or you can and also i would say go to my personal website because i i put because when i was doing this we, we shot all these videos and interviews and they form the basis of interviews it's sort of a magazine kind of thing in its desktop uh, so um you know this sort of um you know this is this um you know, you know it's like a book that you you display coffee table book but also a lot of content but we filmed things and i did it in such a way that you could use your use your phone your the smart your camera your phone to look at a picture and that picture would take you somewhere so not qr codes it's image recognition and it yeah. would take you to these videos but then i i put all the videos out on my website so all the interviews you know with 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 Sir ken robinson with seth godin with noam chomsky with just a one wonderful bunch of people around the world all those videos are on my website so it's it's um it's it, you don't mind yeah it's graham brown martin just one word yeah. dot com slash films and it's all there Great. so if you can't get hold of the book that's the sort of the, the next best option we'll um, put all the forward. links in the show notes and then and, and with the description yeah. of your biography as well that leads nicely into um the the, the first really first question now we're already an hour into to the to, the, to our discussion um Sorry. and you you know you don't have to apologize i knew it would be this and i'm so glad it is because uh we need to remove the bias we need to start doing some sense making we need to have these discussions and get into the depth and substance of of this very complex uh situation we're in and, and kind of see how we can address it I, w I want your wisdom. I want our listeners to have your wisdom. So it's really important. Um, I, I, do you feel like you're a global citizen? And what would you feel about or how would you feel if uh, in the future there was a world without nations, borders, or divisions, at least the divisions of, of human beings one from another? Yeah, I mean, it's something I've, I've been, I'm glad you asked that because it's something I've been uh, speaking about since I was a child, actually. It's like one of those weird kind of things that, that, that's in my head all this time is not understanding why we needed passports. Um, <clears throat> and I did find out why we have passports in there. And they're quite a recent phenomenon, actually. I mean, they're not only sort of 100 or so years, isn't it? Um, but we have passports so we can have poor people. That's it. That's the reason we have them. Um, you know, we divide we have each global... other to suppress. Well, I mean, I, I, and I think that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, you know, so that was preceded um, by the, <clears throat> you know, because you know, borders are, again, particularly in the global south, particularly in the African um, continent and and the, in some parts of South America and um, the Indian subcontinent. You know, you know, if you like, I, I forget the year, I think like 1884 Berlin Conference, or I, I may have got the, the title wrong, but it was where <coughs> Europeans met, European leaders met to <coughs> draw lines on, on, on Africa and then, you know, not understanding how, you know, the, how, how that was, just imprinting their beliefs and, and, you know, carving up because they wanted the resources. You know, that was the whole point. It was like, you know, they'd already dehumanized you know, the entire population of that, that continent in order that people would go along with this. Yeah, nonsense. which is Beth. insanity because there's so many pastoral uh, uh, indigenous and pastoral communities and, and uh, cultures around the world that, uh, you know, uh, in, in one year, they'll travel up to, uh, you know, a thousand kilometers in one year with their herds or the way that they've lived for generation and generation and um, to have that be carved up by, you know, for, you know, this colonialism and capitalism, um, different type of yeah. thought processes is, uh, is unimaginable. Um, but so just to, just to finish on that one then, yeah. so, because <clears throat> you asked me the question is, is like, you know, would I be prepared to live in a world without borders and, and um, you know, having some, I mean, you know, Global, the globalization project um, allowed for the free movement of capital. Um, it never allowed for the free movement of, of, of people. So that would enable me to get, you know, this, this, a t-shirt made by a child in Bangladesh and who doesn't matter whether she gets a PhD, she's never leaving because you haven't got a visa, you know, the little, little gatekeepers and that kind of business. So how do we move? I mean, how would that work? I mean, you know, the arguments that we get now 
is that you know we're seeing it in in the UK right now with our Brexit, um, which is you know we've got we've, we've got our, our closed loop economy over here in the UK. So if people just come along and then want to have welfare and want to get into that system and you know it, it, it won't fit those people you know as i say come over here take our jobs take our homes take it you know, it's, it's this nonsense right um but that's because of how the the system's designed so you know you could of course you could do away with passports and, and nationhood but and actually i think the majority of human beings who i think fundamentally want the same things for themselves and their children and and, and, and so forth and they would live in peace um, you know, it, it's just, there are, you know, the, the, the people who have benefited from how it is and can't see beyond it, it's back to the structure, back to the system, wouldn't allow that. that that's the thing. But it, it's kind of crazy, isn't it? Because if we look at, you know, the combination of what's happening on the world and we look at the, in, the, the growth in population, which doesn't really even really start plateauing until about 10, 11 billion people. You combine that, of course, with the, 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 you know, the, the very damaging aspects of climate change, which are going to affect, you know, the equatorial regions more than, 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 than where, where I am at the moment and so forth. And the making those areas unlivable, you know, affect droughts, um, floods, um, lack of food security and everything else. Of course, when that all happens, of course, is that, you know, when you, when you get that kind of thing, is things start decaying and falling apart and you get disease. What ends up happening is, is you know, <clears throat> and these figures I think have been, been, you know, fairly well supported by evidence is that we, we could be heading to, um, you know, halfway through this century, you know, somewhere in the region of 1 billion climate change migrants, you know, and the question is like, where are they going to go? I mean, you know, and we kind of know what that's about. I don't know. We're seeing that in the UK where, you know, they want people who are trying to cross the English Channel in Ding is to drown. You know, it's it's the you know I know that sounds dramatic, but it's true. You know, it's just you know we, we see the you know, the language of dehumanization. I mean, you know, the the Mexican caravan we're going to be invaded. You know, th this emotive language. You know, these are our people. They're all our people. I mean, you know, it's like we're all distant cousins. We're all, we're all uh, we know, Homo we're all, sapiens. You know, morally, I mean, in any kind of way you look at it, I mean, it's like so. So one billion, you know, climate change. I mean, also, you know, back to the SDG four, you know, SDGs. I mean, it's like, okay, look, this is going to happen. What? Why are we not doing more to in, to ensure that those those people have the at least a fighting chance? to support themselves during this massive change but but no but graham you know? it's it, it's okay I, i'm on the titanic in the upper deck i'm in the luxury cruiser i got the whole suite yeah. so so it's okay right but, but this this has been a strategy i mean <laughs> this has been a strategy i mean it's kissinger i mean it's like it's easy you know you keep africa poor and diseased and the middle east at war i mean that you know and, and, and the result of that because it's good again why why because the system is you know, it's, it's how we behave, you know, how we manage scarcity. And so the reason why that's like that, it's a, it's a consequence of that system. So, you know, far better, I mean, think about it, far better for the African continent to be poor and diseased because that allows us to access a lot of those resources. Same with the Middle East. You don't want everyone kind of connecting. Let's make sure that there's conflict there constantly because that adv that's advantageous. So just so bear that out for a second so people don't the, read, the listeners don't think i'm just on some sort of conspiracy theory type thing absolutely I, not you know, never you know so, so so qatar i know a lot about qatar obviously and it's interesting isn't it really because you know qatar's wealth up until this you know about the second world war was uh, pearls pearl diving and, you know that's where they you know they it was the best place to get pearls and pearls had a value that, that made them consider you know very wealthy and, um, you know, of course, you know, we came up with sort of, you know, cultured pearls, you know, once you had cultured pearls, the value of natural pearls just disappeared. And so, you know, in the early part of, of the 20th century, Qatar moved from being wealthy to being in poverty, you know, no different from, from some of the, the countries that we see, some of the nations that we see on the African continent. But what happened was, of course, you know, I mean, it was delayed but they struck gas and, and, and oil 
um, in, in, their, in their country. So very quickly, when you think about it, I mean, you know, less than 50 years, I mean, you just go to, go to Qatar now, I mean, it's wealthy, there's skyscrapers, there's all, you know, it's become this, you know, powerhouse of, of, of wealth. And yet, you know, oil, I mean, you take Ghana, for example, you know, only about 10 years ago, oil was discovered in, around, uh, in, in Axim on the kind of Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana border. I think people there were very uh, excited, you know, that, that Ghana is going to be wealthy and it's going to have schools and healthcare and roads and internet and all this stuff. But of course, the oil wasn't being extracted by them. It was an American company called Cosmos Energy uh, who were extracting the oil. And so they didn't really get any access. I mean, they, 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 was a, they were, you know, very, they got 5% on the barrel is what, what Ghana was getting. Can you imagine that's, that's obscene? And of course, actually, well, now what happens is the oil gets extracted from Ghana, it gets sent over to, to the US, gets processed and turned into gasoline and the refined, and then sold back. So, I mean, that, how, why? Why do you have countries in, on the African continent? Why, do you don't, why, why does the African continent, after all these years, doesn't have its own extraction companies and extraction engineers and all those? Kind of, why? It's, uh, I mean, yeah. I don't want to get and, off and on that Qatar did it? Yeah, I it is a tangent, but I mean, it was like, but I think that's 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 what I So back to the point about, sorry, it is a tangent, but back to the point about nationhood and everything else. I think it's yes, of course. I think you know we should. I think we should have the movement of people, but we would need to have a different system to accommodate that. And I'm not a believer in a sort of you know no world order or a one world government because I think the problem with that is it's like you know. It's, you know, this, again, this is a kind of this is a current system view of how you govern. I mean, the left right type thing, which is a false paradigm. Um, I, I don't think if, if I can interrupt, I, Sorry, I don't that was long. I, no, no, <laughs> no, you're fine. I, I don't think we were getting off on a tangent in that I, I wanted to kind of follow up what you were saying. So I, I totally agree. Uh, um, and that's just obviously one one example that you were giving there but it's a resource curse. And we see that resource curse in many, many countries where they sell whatever the resource is at the time, whether it's uh, pearls or whether it's oil or fossil fuels, or um, there's many African uh, countries that produce a, a lot of food and, and use their land um, for other countries benefit. Um, <clears throat> And, and I want to go back actually and tickle a little bit of what, of what, you, what you said. And let's get into the big thoughts of that. And then I want you to finish your train of thought of where, where you were going with that. Um, I see it as a, a resource curse, is that you have some form of land or fossil fuels or pearls or whatever resource diamonds, whatever it is. Um, and you basically, it becomes a curse because you short sell it for short term gains. And the crazy thing is, is it's being sold to other countries and nations that have absolutely no interest in seeing that Ghana or Qatar or anywhere else is benefited of. And the, 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 the example I like to use is actually New Zealand or Australia um, or even Brazil, where they l allow um, animal agriculture, the to mass huge uh, feedlots of animals to basically shit on their land and their environment, use their fresh water, use their crops to feed those animals. Uh, I have nothing against the animals um, and, and then extrude ex enormous amounts of farts and burps and shit of methane into the atmosphere, which immediately first affects New Zealand, Brazil, uh, Australia, and then they ship the product at a less than true cost or total value of that product to some other country for their benefit. And that is whether you're a, a mathematician, a scientist, a farmer, is a bad business model. You're letting them use your country, your resources, 
as an open sewer, as their toilet, and then reap and benefit all the benefits of that uh, for the future. And it's come back in this last uh, fires that Australia had in, in uh, the end of the year and beginning of the year, really is closely tied to that type of resource curse in any country you look that because for a short short term gain they're 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 selling that 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 resource and 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 it doesn't have that long term sustainability they say all the money we make we're going to invest sustainably with infrastructure so that in the future it, it doesn't matter this little impact that we have now because we have better processes and we're going to be more resilient in the future and and that's something that i don't think is all always discussed or explained how, how that works but it happens time and time again all over the world and where it ties to brexit is the initial big majority of the vote and i'm not i'm not from the uk so i really probably can't speak but you you mentioned it was because they were worried they were getting their jobs stolen the majority of jobs that were being taken were agriculture, you know, farming, food production, those migrant seasonal workers who came in to do the food. So my first question is, is now that Brexit has occurred, did all those people who voted for that, did they jump in during the pandemic and take those jobs that are now no longer filled? So why the fuck did they vote for it? Why did they not say, oh yeah, they got what they wanted, but they did get what they wanted. They fucked themselves as a country uh, 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 because of that bad decision, because they didn't think ahead. And, and, and what happened is during the pandemic, those farm products, those pr the production of that food got tilled back under because the workers weren't there to harvest it. So what kind of a messed up system is that? I mean, I just, I don't, I hate to get off on a tangent. No, but it, just I, but I, 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 no it, 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 it's, it does tie in. All of these things tie in. They're, they're all part of the same problem. I mean, the, the things you're talking about in terms of farming and the stripping back of deforestation in order to feed cows so that you can make burgers. I mean, you know, there was, it's a, it's a lack of design. I mean, it's, you know, it's asking the wrong question. I mean, we need to ask a different question now. It's like, the question is, I think the question we should be asking is how, you know, how can we how can we create a uh, a society that allows all people to thrive, include and the planet? That, that that's the sort of question. Then you design around that, don't you? Design okay. How do we feed eight billion people? How do we feed eleven billion people? How do how do we do that? And you know, and then you 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 think, oh, actually, look, we 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 could do that thing. We could just take away the trees and and have you know billions of cows farting, but it's going to fuck the planet. So let's not do that. That, 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 you know, design it a different way. I mean, of course, it, what, it needs to be wise after the event. Now, switching to Brexit, I think it's, it's unfair, actually, I think, to blame um, the people who voted to leave the European Union, because I think it's very complex, that. And I think that, that you know, I think it, a lot of being saying, oh, they're stupid or this or that. I, I, just, I don't think that's, you know, I understand where those beliefs are coming from, but I think this polarisation of, of opinion is, 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 is manipulated and, and, and so forth. I think... There was, um, to, to, think, to understand why it happened <clears throat> is actually, there's a, there's a uh, Professor Guy Standing, uh, University College London, um, who, who wrote on this <clears throat> way before the, the EU vote. And he, he labelled a, a sort of there's a, a class, if you like, a new class of people that have emerged, called, he calls the precariat. You know, this is the salar there's a salariat, the people that are salaries of precariat who, you know, live hand to mouth, uh, they don't have income security and so forth. Now, <clears throat> the reason why the precariat, I'll, I'll come to in a second. So, you know, if we look at, uh, and I'm going to do this very quickly, that, that sort of history of the UK, you know, there was a massive manufacturing uh, capability, you know, part of the industrial, I mean, let's, forget, let's not forget the industrial revolution started here in Manchester. And so the original factories and, and the kind of the, the shift from or the transformation from craft production to mass production occurred here first through factories and, and, and so forth. So there was employment, the mines and everything else. Now, because of the system that we operate in, those businesses are private businesses. They are they they have you know the, the way it works is they have to return more value, more profits. You know we their economic economic model consists of, of of continuous growth. When it doesn't grow, we get worried. You know all that kind of business we read in the papers. 
But what happened was, of course, in order to do that, you know, we, 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 we eventually, the rest of the world caught up and actually manufacturing this stuff was a lot cheaper in China than it was here. I mean, it just, you know, crazy. So yeah, Dyson, for example, you know, um, you know, there he was, he, he voted, didn't he? For, you know, he's very pro-Brexit, but he gets his kit manufactured overseas. And that's because you make more profit. And actually, it's, you know, the China have got it nailed. I mean, the, the, the quality of their manufacturing is incredible, you know. Um, so rather than, you know, so why don't we have jobs? So rather than actually saying, well, it's because we moved them because so we can make more profit. No, 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 that, that wasn't said, of course. You know, because that would, that would, suddenly people would wake up and see the big picture, which is that, you know, you're being exploited. But instead, it's much easier because once you have people who are, you know, maybe second generation unemployed they, you know their father was only mother and father was unemployed they're unemployed it's like you know why is this happening to me why and it's much easier then to weaponize those people if you want to manipulate those people you want to start using facebook ads and, and, and twitter ai bots and all this kind of stuff to polarize the argument what you do is you tell them it's those people that don't look like you and that can be borne out, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a gentleman over here called James O'Brien. It's a great radio show on LBC, the only good radio show on LBC, because the rest is trash. But, um, you know, he, he does these interviews and, and you, know, he, 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 you know, he has a perspective, but he just asks questions, people that have voted for, for Brexit. And, you know, so, well, you know, it, it goes like this, you know, ask questions, and, but, you know, so we, don't, we can make our own rules. And then he'll say, well, which rules were coming out of EU that you didn't agree with and what do you think is going to change? And then there's no answer, of course, because it's something they've read on a Facebook thing. I mean, it's not their fault though. I mean, this is like, you know, it's a failure of government and, and failure of leadership. Um, and then it goes to, okay, well, so, so yeah, I and mean, we won't have all those immigrants over here taking our jobs. And, and then he goes, well, what do you mean? Which immigrants? And, and then you'll find sometimes someone will say, well, you know, when I go to my supermarket, you know, there wasn't a single white person on the checkout desks. And then the question goes, well, okay, so leaving the EU is only about EU movement. So which European country can you tell me that is majority not white? And there it is. So you've got a population, I don't believe that the British are intrinsically racist. You know, I think racism is something that is manufactured you know, and, and for value, because the value, of course, of dividing people, you know, the value of dehumanizing people and using the language of dehumanization is, is very profitable, you know, in this system that we have. I'm not, you know, it's not sort of conspiratorial. I mean, you know, but it, it just, it, it, it works in that system. And that's, you know, I think why, I mean, you know, you had a society here that wasn't caring for its people, you know, the sort of London centric thinking, um, you know, the southeast of England thinking, just ignoring really what was happening to large parts of, of the country. We know we had a government here. I mean, actually, the government that's in power now, you know, it was under Thatcher where someone called Norman Tebbit told people, well, if you haven't got a job, get on your bike. You know, leave your community, leave your family, you know, go somewhere else to get the job. Not actually, yes, we have to shut down mining, you know, that we have to move on manufacturing. So, you know, use our education structure, use our societal structure to kind of to, to create, you know, new employment and different ways of working and, and so forth. Because whereas in the industrial revolution, you know, with the early factories, you know, we were concerned about the inhumane nature of work, you know, long hours, dark factories, pollution and so forth, breathing it in. Now we should be concerned about the inhuman nature of not working because when you're not working, you don't have a voice in society, you don't have agency, you don't have equity, and therefore you are inevitably open to a different narrative. And that's the problem. That's why I believe Brexit happened. It was just a failure to look after our own people. And this is, this is the result. And I think what's going to happen, because actually, you know, yes, um, Brexit has started, we don't actually leave, it, properly that we don't put the borders up and the shutters up until the end of 2020 so we'll find out on the first of January. it's difficult to see how this is going to work because it's clear now that you know there was a there's a very it's a narrow population but a very influential population within the current administration that wanted to crash out of europe so to not have any 
uh, trading a relationship, even though it's the largest trading group on the planet, to have nothing at all, you know, and to just go it on our own. I mean, like in 2020, 2021, just go it on our own. And of course, a lot of people, because that, that's what they've been reading, you know, we know that the Leave EU campaign was a lie, was fraudulent, and everything else. I had ex ex foreign. Uh, and external influences paying for those Facebook ads Denver and everything else. We know it was illegal, yeah. but nevertheless, we're going for it because, you know, what we'll end up with, because they all, everyone said, we're not going to crash out. We're going to have a, you know, a friendly agreement with our European neighbors. Uh, that's all they said. And now it's not going to happen. Now, I think this is a problem. This is a real problem now. I think that, that when our people, when the people here understand and realize they've been lied to there's going to be trouble you know it, the trouble will initially start with uh increased violent racism you know homegrown terrorism in the form of white supremacist terrorism we're already seeing that we've got all you know organizations like britain first video video in themselves and putting it on facebook walking around hot you know hotels that are putting up immigrants during the coronavirus and banging on their doors and terrorizing them you know just the other weekend in Trafalgar Square, there was a protest that was ostensibly about not wearing masks and anti-masks and anti-vaxxing. And a group there felt absolutely comfortable and were not stopped unfolding the British Nazi party flag in Trafalgar Square. So what we're gonna see is a lot of that. You know, people are gonna to to continue to, to believe this false narrative about anyone that doesn't look like them, particularly people who aren't white are gonna face a horrible time here. And that's going to trigger a, 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 another reaction back. But after that, what's gonna happen is once all that's done, is a realization that they've been played. And I think that's when things get really bad. I mean, I think there's a belief, and you mentioned it earlier about the collapses of society. You know, there's, a, there's a belief that of course, you know, rule Britannia, you know, we are you know, British exceptionalism. I think we're gonna find, uh, get a little lesson soon. I think that, you know, as you described earlier, societies you know it's gradually then suddenly they collapse under their own weight and and under their own exceptionalism and i think we are it's very perilous i mean you know we we have a global pandemic you know we will get a second wave of, of this in the winter it's quite obvious the the r rate is going up here because you know stupidity really and, and a, an absolutely delinquent government and corrupt government um so that's going to happen. There, there, obviously, the flu and everything else uh, will, will be happening, and then crashing out of Europe, where we can't get supplies of certain things and everything else. You know, I mean, I hope I'm wrong. You know, a lot of these predictions, I always hope I'm wrong. I want to be proven wrong, but I, I think this is this is we are on the brink of catastrophe here, We're uh, and it doesn't seem to be a you know we don't have the government that will enable us to go through because there there is a group of people, influential people that you know. That will bet on on collapse. That will that disaster capitalism, as it as it's called, and 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 we are in their hands at the moment. And it's it's horrible to see that. It's horrible to see this this country go through that. You know, I, I think you know we're we're definitely going to move here in a moment out of uh, some of the doom and gloom or the panic in in our discussion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we, we, we need to touch upon it because it does need. To, uh, we need to kind of instill some sense making, remove the biases and understand what's going on. And, and what you just mentioned, um, it, it's not just Brexit. It's not, I mean, we've seen it all over the world and, I, and, and you mentioned that, but I, I live in Hamburg, Germany and Germany seem extreme, you know, thinking there's a superior race and, and uh, uh, many issues there that how, <clears throat> many things went wrong there, but now you're seeing some new things where people are being led astray and they're showing that, you know, the Nazi flags and, and, and that uh, Cambridge Analytics and this fake news, face, fake media, this way how the wrong narratives, the wrong stories, or also this misinformation has bubbled to the surface and people uh, are, are lacking the time or the ability to make sense of it, to kind of distill out the truths uh, of what's happening and also have that longer vision, that bigger picture mm -hmm. of what's going on. I mean, there's so, uh, when we first began our discussion, it was really interesting how um, we were talking about the, the masks and, and uh, you just mentioned the masks again as a movement that we're not gonna wear masks, we're not gonna social distance. Um, 
uh, just a few years ago uh, in Europe, especially, there was this big thing about, you know, burqa is a religious thing for I Islam and, and that where, you know, you're not allowed to wear a burqa, cover your face and that. Now, it, that, that, there's no conversation about that. They want everybody to cover their face and do it. And it's now it's all, all of a sudden, it's okay. And I don't, you know, there's a different reason for that. But, um, you know, it, it's interesting how these laws, these rules, the protections can pivot on a dime. They can change. We're learning and evolving that we really need to, to get that sense making and put it into perspective on the big picture of, of where we're trying to go. Um, I, I don't know if you have any more to add on that, but I, I think it's just important to realize that this, the, we're all distant cousins. We're all on the same spaceship Earth and by us working and taking an active part in our world and, and, and that change and that reshaping, it really uh, it can uh, change an outcome and unify us for where we want to go in yeah, the future. Yeah, I mean, and, I mean, you're right. I mean, to touch on that, really, I mean, you know, the sort of the, 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 the uh, burqa and, and um, you know, niqab and, and so on, this sort of um, anti-Islam uh, as, a, as, a, as a sort of a, a movement, really. I mean, you know, just a, in a long line of movements. I mean, of course, it's a, you know, it's just another way of dividing people. Um, you know, it's, you know, we're seeing also, we mentioned nationalism, we're also seeing not only nationalism based on borders, we're seeing ethnic nationalism emerging again, you know, which is, I think, very concerning. And it's actually self-defeating. I mean, you know, the, the point is, you know, nature is really clever. I mean, you know, you know, there's biodiversity, you know, why is that biodiversity? Because actually, if, if, if one thing is struggling, it has another answer to that struggle. And that's why we have biodiversity. I mean, we're reducing our biodiversity, which is could be catastrophic. But the point is, it's like having difference in that mix makes you healthier. So you apply that to human society. You know, actually, if you have monocultures, find it impossible to innovate. Because actually innovation comes from seeing the world differently and, and joining up the dots between different things and even seeing dots that other people can't see. Now, if you're trying to innovate, I mean, actually having people from different backgrounds, you know, different nations, different belief systems and, and so forth, that's, that's actually very useful because it gives you alternative views, alternative ways of looking at things. And that's how innovation happens. Innovation can only happen through diversity. Now, we have to, I mean, you know, on the positive note, you know, I think that for one reason or another, we are going to have to switch to a regenerative economy. That's beyond circular because <clears throat> sustainability is not enough now. It has to be regenerative. We have to regenerate the planet. We have to put more stuff back. And, you know, that's a design issue. But the fact that we have to switch to a regenerative economy means actually and this is sort of linked to education and linked to, to the new version of capitalism and everything else, it actually means we have to redesign everything, every product, every service. We have to redesign everything because everything that we have at the moment is designed for a, uh, you know, based around extractive, a scarcity society. We need to do something different. And this actually is, is wonderful news because people are worried about the future of work and unemployment and all this kind of stuff. And you think about, you know, we're going, we're, you know, as the consequence of the pandemic, we are heading into the largest global recession of human history and mass global unemployment. And yet there's an answer that's staring us in the face. I mean, if only we had a big global infrastructure program to work on. Well, guess what? We do. It's called fixing climate change. It's, it's called fixing our home. And that is the biggest global infrastructure product. It would involve everyone. We are, will be heading to a golden age of innovation and creativity and globally, because this will have to be a global. This will have to be global. Because we're not going to Mars. You know, we're not going, you know, we, we, we might go there to have a look and see and, and you know, understand things, but we're not all going to live there. This is our home. It's beautiful. I mean, if you can't see, if you can't see that, it's crazy. And I think that this, is 
where this is this is our human destiny and all the things that we've covered in this conversation the issues that people are concerned about in their movements with blm and lbgq plus and and, the first, and it, that all comes together the sdg force you won't need them anymore because we have to redesign everything you know i, I do believe I, I, you know, I have to be optimistic we are going to head into some dark days first i mean again back to gramsci we are in the interregnum <clears throat> and in the interregnum morbid things happen there was going to be some really bad stuff that's going to happen. I mean, you know, there is, it is going to happen. But I do believe in human beings. I do believe at some point we're going to see the light. And I do believe there is a, a, a much larger movement of people who will say no more. That, no that more. really leads me uh, nicely before you get too deep, because I know <laughs> I kind of can sense where you're going. We, we think alike in a lot of ways. Um, my hardest question for you is really the burning question, WTF, and it's not the swear word, it's what's the future? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, um, well, I hope there is a future is my, is my answer. And, I, you know, it, it's, you know, the things that, you know, I'm concerned about now, I'm interested, I mean, again, you know, I've got children and, you know, I believe in human beings. And I believe in, the, in what we have. I mean, I think the question is, is what, what is, how do we get to the 22nd century? You know, because I think if we, if on the current trajectory, I don't think that we are going to have you know, the, the human society that we have now, I don't think will exist. I think that there's going to be, you know, we, if we, there's, that we're at a crossroads at the moment. You know, we could be in a situation, we continue down this sort of ethnic nationalism and nationalism. I mean, <clears throat> Give you an example. I mean, this is what there's two different parameters, two different things I think that could happen. You know, let's say, for example, um, we wake up in the sort of middle of November after the American election, and and you know, Mr. Trump is has got a second term. Um, <clears throat> now, to, to be honest, I think the left-right paradigm is broken. I don't think it makes much difference whether he comes in or not. But let's just go with that, you know, because I think well, whoever you vote for, that it is still the system. Right? But anyway, let's not go down that road. So Mr. Trump, Donald Trump becomes the president again, second term. Now, that, that's a mandate, really. I mean, for all the bluff and bluster and all the kind of hand wringing and, and, and you know, name calling and all that kind of stuff, it will be a mandate. Now, it, it's interesting, you know, we're seeing, um, you know, we've gone from make America great again to America first. Right. So just, just hold on to what that means, because what I'm talking about is American futurism, which is one one, rea one possible reality. So what, what that happens is, is that, you know, with America first, you know, think it, it's like, okay, they have technological leadership. I mean, once upon a time we had, you know, we used to make computers in Europe. We used to have European operating systems and we were the leader in mobile France. <clears throat> Not anymore. The wealth is concentrated in Silicon Valley, mainly. I mean, you've got all the, these enormous, I mean, Apple worth $2 trillion. You know, we are relying on all these operating systems, our mobile phones, I think I said, you know, Google, Facebook, Netflix, LinkedIn, Microsoft. I mean, it's all there. So you've got this technological lead that's going on. And you, if we look at the, what's happening, they're going to the moon right now. Remember, I, was, you know, I remember watching Neil Armstrong take that step on the moon. And it was for all mankind. Do you think they're going to say that this time when they step on the moon? No, America first. So with America first strategy, I mean, you know, you, you just surge forward, you cut off the rest of the world. You don't, you know, ex I'm going to extract as much fossil fuel and shit out of this planet and belch it all out because America first, you know, we're going to have full employment. We're going to take up all the resources and, and, and there's, there's rather of history. And I'm not, this is not being anti-American. I actually love America and that's why I care. Okay, just be, be very clear about that. But you can see how this is intoxicating this idea of, you know, yes, you know, we're going to go to Mars, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and it surges forward. And of course, futurism is rooted in Italian fascism. That's, that's that emergence, because as that goes on, of course, that isolationism, you then start thinking about racial purity and all those kinds of things. The rest of the world then suffers because it's not being, being you know, not being shared. How, how do we respond? I think that's one possible future, because then what happens is, is that, you know, you get America first, Britain becomes like a 51st state, um, you know, you've got Russia for, I mean, you've got that kind of thing going on. And then the people who are poor now just get ignored. I mean, it doesn't matter. We're just going to extract everything out of Africa. So, you know, don't care. That's one thing. The other thing I think, that, you know, the one that I, I prefer to believe in and, and, and hope is, is a future where, you know, 
for, for just reasons of survival, but hopefully we don't get to that point, is that actually we come to our senses. And I think this is, again, I think it's because of Generation Z, I think as a, as a, as a catalyst, you know, the, you know, it, you know, the, the generations either side obviously have to be part of this, but it's a catalyst. I think that that, you know, I think because using the levers of capitalism, I mean, capitalism in itself isn't necessarily bad. It's depending on what system that you're operating in. I mean, you know, we could get to a post-scarcity society. So where I'm thinking is that, you know, we move to a post-scarcity society, which is, what do I mean by that? You know, if we go back in time, you know, we could have been there already. I mean, you know, we go back in time. So in, in um, 1850, um, there was uh, Augustus Mouchin, Augustin Mouchin, Mouchou, Mouchou, Augustin Mouchou in France, in Paris. And, and he built the world's first solar powered steam engine. Um, you know, I mean, at the time, 1850, I mean, you know, it was wood and coal that was, that was you know, but he, he made a, a, you know, using a parabolic trough to capture the sun and beam it you know, concentrate it into a, a pipe that had water and then turned it into steam and then was, you know, running a, a printing press and all those kind of things. 1850, using the power of the sun, you know, an exhaustible yeah. supply of energy. Zip forward, 1912, okay. Frank Schumann, an American inventor, along with Charles, um, Vernon, uh, Ver Vernon Short, Charles, I've got the name wrong, but it's Vernon Boyce, sorry, Vernon Boyce, a, a British physicist. Together, they, des they, they continued the parabolic trough work that Mushu had started. And then in, in, in 1912, built a uh, solar thermal power station on the bank of the River Nile that would pump, using the power of the sun, would pump 33,000 gallons of water every minute out of uh, the Nile into arid desert land. Now, why am I telling you that? The point is, is that at that point, this is 1912, we had a technology which could generate an infinite, inexhaustible amount of free, clean energy. And as a byproduct, because of the way it works, an inexhaustible free supply of drinking water. Now, I just want to, you know, for us and the, and the listeners to think about what would have happened if we'd have continued with that, what would have happened if every nation, every place, every person had access to free, inexhaustible supply of energy and water? You know, what would the world look like now in 2020 if we'd have done that, if we'd have continued down that road? You know, a variety of reasons that we didn't, you know, the, the, the wars that broke out, the, you know, the Spanish flu, you know, the, the Great Depression, another war and everything else, it was all locked us in to a different economic model around scarcity. But just imagine for a moment if we had cracked that, because we could have done, you know? I mean, it's like, you know, this idea that we can't do solar, it's not as efficient. I mean, that's because that doesn't fit into the narrative of a world that's based on scarcity. So I think that, you know, if in a more positive way is that we can expand on this, we can innovate on this, we'll have to anyway. Once we innovate correctly, because if, the, if we ask the right question, how do we support every person on the planet so they can thrive and the planet itself? The answer has to be post-scarcity. It has to be around these kinds of technologies, just for really good reason. And I think with that, we fall into a different kind of world. You know, because, you know, and actually, you know, we, we, we talk about AI, and AI has a massive role to play in solving some of these complex problems. But the interesting thing about AI is that it requires the, the computing power to do these kind of things that we keep hearing about requires so much energy. And the, you know, because even I think it's like 8% oh, of, of, of the CO2 in the air is created at the moment by computing technology. So the problem there, of course, is that the AI needed to do the things that that even the, 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 you know, the Elon Musks of this world want to do, you would have to generate so much electricity and, and it would create so much damage to the planet that you, you wouldn't be able to do it unless, unless you had a parabolic trough and a free supply, an inexhaustible supply of energy. And that's the point. And we know this, you know, it, the planet is designed like this, 
you know, there is, you know, there's a reason why there's this enormous energy source that we see every single day. And it's there, you know, we just use that. And it's like, we have to get over, and I think we will, we have to get over the, this, you know, the situation that we have now. I mean, you know, it's like, it is hard because how do you go to Jeff Bezos? You go, hey, Jeff, congratulations. You won that round. Now we're changing the game, so put all your money back. That's, that's hard, isn't it? It's gonna be hard, you know? But if we don't, it's gonna be a lot harder. So I think I will, I will vote for the, the future where we look after our planet and we look after everybody. And I don't think that makes me a hippie. I think it's just like, it's just common sense. Common sense, it's a better business model. It has better outcome. It's multiple desire, resilient, desirable futures. I'm, I'm in full alignment with you. That I, 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 I do uh, agree with you on many things on, on how you gave us kind of the two versions and you said that, you know, it will probably get worse and we'll experience those things. You know, we've, we've known that for a while. That's the book, the, the limits to growth. The second version was beyond the limits to growth. We're, we're kind of already outside of the safe operating spaces of our planetary boundaries. It's inevitable that we're, we're not going to face these. But there is a, a real way that we can, as, as exponentially and as fast as these things are going in the wrong direction, or even in the good direction, we can use that or those tools that have been around, as you mentioned, for a long time, just as fast to pivot on a dime, to change things, to change the system, to make it work. Um, and it's been proven and, and shown time and time again. I, I wanted to touch uh, a little bit or maybe have you elaborate more. You're the co-founder of Regenerative Global. Um, and I, I use regenerative agriculture, regenerative practices, the actually in <clears throat> the endless um, um, amounts of re- terminology that are possible, repurpose, recycle, reuse, replace, uh, regenerate, rebuild, you know, ex on and on. The, the whole regenerative circular economy, one planet living type of, type of thinking is beautiful. Tell us more about Regenerative Global, but also you, in the last few years, you've come out more speaking about regeneration and other things and and you've mentioned it this whole time in our conversation can you go on more into depth about yeah, that thank you i'd love i'd love to um so yeah i mean i have been banging on about this for years i was sort of thinking about it the other day actually i remember as a, as a 15 year old boy i came to london with a friend to attend a greenpeace meeting and i was like wondered why we were there so it has been a sort of an interest really about you know for a long time and so regenerative.global i think was was really a, a sort of a, a sort of sandbox a sort of thinking tank uh, not a think tank but an area where myself and a friend and and colleague um bill rankin william uh, william rankin um who who used to for its worth be the director of learning at apple uh, inc in california but also a university professor and everything else you know fiercely intelligent academic um and, and he and i you know we've started we've struck up a friendship and um this was an area where we start doing some of our thinking or some of our blue sky thinking initially i think and specifically around, around learning and education i think we've both been in, interested um in how do we transform the learning systems um to this kind of you know creative and innovative get away from this kind of 19th century education system that we had so that was a starting place um for, for that thinking and <clears throat> Certainly, that's that's where a lot of the, the writing uh, you can find on there. But also, I think as as we were developing those ideas, you know, this kind of my interest in global economics and 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 all this sort of kind of started shaping my thinking because I just again I just didn't feel that we could change. Having tried it for a long time, we could change education because it won't change. We it's no point in carrying on trying to do that. It's possible uh, to for teachers to try to do the kind of practice that we're talking about and get kids through these you know, arbitrary exams. So what, that's, you know, what we've been thinking about now, and this is literally, it's a blue sky uh, thinking, that's what the whole thing's about, is then looking at, um, you know, I wrote this article called, Why Don't You Design a School? And what I was thinking, this is in response really to the, the pandemic and people you know, working from home and children 
um, you know, using online systems uh, and online teaching rather than online learning. And then I'm thinking actually, <clears throat> you know, this, the, the education systems really aren't designed for, 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 for anyone really. I mean, you know, we, you know, we accept that schools, um, you, know, the, you know, head teachers, principals will say quite proudly that, you know, 10% or up to 15% of their students get an A or an A plus in their end of, you know, period exams. Well, that kind of means that it's broken, doesn't it? I mean, if only 10% or 15% are the ones that can get through it um, with that kind of life-changing you know, thing, I mean, that's wrong. I mean, you know, if, if any other business said, oh, 10% you know, of my customers are happy, I mean, it would close, wouldn't it? I mean, the shareholder revolt and everything else. And I think that that's, that's a sort of a problem. So I started looking at, you know, also the, the, the school refusers, the school haters. I mean, I was, um, you know, as a child, I was a school refuser. You know, I, didn't, I, I truanted, I made up illnesses. Um, you know, I only found out later in life what that was. I mean, I was, you know, I was assessed as autistic. Um, and that's quite a, quite a thing amongst autistics and, 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 and kids with ADHD as well. And then, you know, I realized why I was doing it. But it was interesting because I, you know, at that time, I used to just bunk off and, and, and teach myself at universities and all that kind of business. And it really was a sort of autodidact. Um, everything I know, I mean, I, I've learned by osmosis, I think. I don't, you know, it's not like I sit around reading tons of books all the day. I don't know where it comes from. And that's just typical uh, of, of someone with an autistic brain, I guess. Um, but then I started thinking, okay, well, if we were designing something that, you know, had this, was, was some of it was online, what would that be like? Because what I was realizing, having then been spending all this time online, you know, as everyone else, was, it was going crazy because the things I was missing were the bits in between. You know, it's like the, the bits where you were going into another meeting or you were traveling or, you know, those are the things that sort of miss. Now, I, you know, I go from, uh, you know, by week, I go from meeting to meeting to meeting. I mean, I've been in like Saudi Arabia, Beirut, California, all in one day, just, just, just but nothing in between. Um, but also then I was looking at conferences and how conferences were working. Because what I, I just realized that all the conferences that I would have attended went online. And then I realized, oh, I could jump, but I could run, I could, go, I could be at three conferences in one day and I could just curate and just go to the one I'm interested in. So that's like applying that to an idea of what, 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 what would a, a different system for an online system be? And I think this is where regenerative lands, which was the idea that um, if we were designing a school, we, we, we wouldn't, we wouldn't call it a school. In fact, actually, we wouldn't design a school because I think if you start with the question, you know, let's design a school, then you end up with the wrong answer, you know, because school is a loaded, it's a highly regulated space. Um, you know, all the highfalutin ideas that I have, you couldn't do in, in a school. So you, you have to ask a different question. And the question then came back to the one is how do we create an environment where people can thrive in the planet? So how do we institute a sort of regenerative economy? And it was a kind of a way, an answer to how do we get to, from the linear economy to an extractive economy without having catastrophe or war and everything else. And so this idea sort of generating and the idea that we were, that we were having, and I call it you know, regenerative um, dot OS. Um, as an operating system, as operating system. I thought the only way to do this actually would be to kind of create an environment which may be in the digital world, may be in the sort of cyber world, but, but not, not specifically as a learning type thing, but that's just a, a product of it because, you know, it, it's the idea of like, you know, going into an environment and into a digital world, which is a bit like, war, you know, like sort of World of Warcraft, for example, you know, where you're meeting other citizens in there and, um, solving problems and challenges and things together as a, as a sort of a, a thing that you do. I mean, it's just an interesting thing that you do. And on the, as a consequence of that, learning lots of things, but, but just because in order to advance through this, this world. And so it's kind of like, you know, combining things like, you know, gaming technologies with collaborative technologies and all this kind of business. And then I just saw that as, okay, what, if you can crack that bit, I mean, you still have to have the physical world, right? Because if we, if we don't interact with each other, what's the point, do you know what I mean, in the physical world? But I was just thinking that this could change the way that we look at learning because it's, it's what we do is we sort of, as, as Seymour Papert, one of, you know, the late Seymour Papert, one of, one of the people that I took a lot of influence from, you know, using this system, we could abandon streaming people, kids by age. Why? Why is that important that we stream kids by age? We can abandon the curriculum because actually, you know, design our own curriculum. What's important to us 
our communities and so forth. I mean, you know, why do we have to have this curriculum? Because education is a cultural reproduction system. Why? And so we, we can do away with the uniformity of what all children learn or all, all people learn. And I thought this environment might be a way of doing that where you start engaging. And then I thought, as that OS develops, um, it's also where you go and sort of trade your skills and knowledge and, 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 you know, and then I'm thinking, okay, well, that becomes a whole kind of different operating system, this kind of place where you go and you could, if you wanted to put a form of, of, of currency or cryptocurrency, if you, if that's the kind of environment that you want. And so this was, this is where, sorry, it's a long answer, but this is where that I, you know, this is where I think it's going. And, and, you know, I wrote this article, I went out there, it went viral. I mean, you know, I'm talking like hundreds of thousands of people hitting that, that site and lots of interesting calls and everything else. And, and, and it's on my media blog, go, go, and regenerative.global and find it there. I hope you like it. I mean, that, you know, what I'm saying here doesn't, it sounds a bit amorphous because I'm trying not to use the wrong language. It's almost like I'm inventing a language because this is the problem about trying to imagine something that isn't what we have now. You know, this, uh, this system, the, the intention is that it would have a decentralized AI. Decentralized is because all the AI systems that we see at the moment are centralized. So like Google own them or Pearson in education want to use AI to sell more of their content. And the problem with a centralized AI is that it, know, it has to know a lot about you. And therefore we've got massive privacy issues and everything else. So I want to approach AI in a different way. I want to, like, as, a, as anyone that comes into this OS, bearing in mind this doesn't exist, it's just in my head. Um, but when you come into this OS, you're, 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 you're given your own AI. It's like a Tamagotchi. <clears throat> it doesn't know anything. Uh, you know, it knows how to absorb information like a child, a baby. But it does it very fast. And it just follows you around in that system. And it's like, you know, as, even at the beginning where you, because people ask me, what age group is this for? I said, no, it's for ability, not age. You go in, as you land in a system, it might ask you a whole bunch of questions. You know, can you read this? It will kind of determine, maybe, maybe you're dyslexic, maybe you're, it doesn't really care, it doesn't label it, but it just wants to know how you engage. So this AI starts learning this stuff about you and you have to give it access to you and your stuff. And the only way you can do that is make sure that you're the only one that owns it. It has to be decentralized. It can't be owned by a Google or a, or a major corporation, you know, an Apple or whatever, you know. Because ultimately, it will go bad if you, if you do that. Because you, then you could use the AI to nudge people in all kinds of directions that would be unethical. But the idea is that that would be the thing that would allow you to build a general purpose instrument for, for your life. But of course, trying to do this and create this, it's very hard to speak to people. There's no concise kind of elevator pitch for this idea because it's, it's too broad. And obviously, I've got to work on it a bit more. In, but it, it went from kind of a, a sort of fantasy to something that I'm now actively pursuing because I think it's possible to do it. The, the problem, or the, the challenge of doing it is how do you do it without taking commercial funding? So you don't have you know, like shareholders that want to return on investment where they want to start selling your advertising and all this, you know, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to you know, say that that stuff doesn't have a place. It doesn't have a place in this system. But the simple reason is that this isn't about exploiting people or monetizing them. It's about liberating them and I was hoping that in designing this system and, you know, which would require thousands of collaborators, it gives us an environment where we can start solving these big challenges. How do we, how do we fix stuff? How do we create stuff? And in doing so, it provides that transitory technology so that we don't end up having to have a war or a revolution exactly. um, for this to happen. Because it's like, you know, it's, it's, you know, I'm fundamentally against those kinds of things. I think that war and, and, and as famine is a, just a, is a product of, of this system. I don't believe it's human nature um, to stab each other in the back um, to get on top. I just don't, I think that's just an absolute nonsense that's been sold to us. I mean, that's not what Charles Darwin meant. Yeah, I, sorry, I don't, sorry, that was very long again. No, Everything's that's, very long. that's <laughs> fine. I, I, I think that, um, you know, there's so many uh, things that we haven't touched upon. I, I don't, I don't believe in neo-Darwinism. I don't believe in neoliberalism. I, I, I believe that uh, we're, we're all part of this symbiotic earth and, and that we're all distant cousins. And the only way to really make it work is through 
cooperation, collaboration, that we really see each other as part of this symbiotic earth. And what you, what you mentioned there is um, really interesting. Uh, just last, or, or actually this week, I um, had a podcast with uh, Chris Boos, uh, Hans Christian Boos, who does a lot with AI and the German government, uh, Merkel and that. And uh, I, you know, I also do uh, a lot of this. I work with a company out of Australia called Soul Machines. I'm working on it. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 a, yeah. The, the avatar yeah, thing. Yeah, Fantastic. yeah. AI yeah. digital twin yeah, no, avatar. It's brilliant. I, I, I think I'm, I'm linked in with one of those guys. It's fabulous. Yeah, and so I, I and it's all, it's all real a big experiment, and there's a lot of, you know, uh, controversy and discussion about it. But I, I talked to Chris, and, and uh, you know, I, I would like to see AI in some form. Uh, help us get a real time update of collective intelligence, not only uh, that we don't make the same mistakes that we made in the past, but also, you know, uh, just give us that that information, that big history that maybe we might not be getting or, or, or the bigger picture and still leave it up to us to discern, but just to have that information that we can't find on Google and can't find in books or that's not readily available there in some respects. That's a whole different topic. And, and that's also a, a whole different thing that we really didn't get a touch on that much during this discussion, but we're, we're not going to be able to, but uh, you do a lot with innovations, technology, you, you kind of have this techno lust, uh, you're kind of a nerd like me in, in that respect. So <laughs> you have a long history, uh, you know, if anybody's ever listened to your talks or, or that, you, you give them the kind of that journey of how it began and how, how you got involved and, and o almost a, a, a punk uh, cyber hacker, uh, you know, there's a, a multiple different transition how you got there, but innovation, technology, AI, and those things also pay, play a part in this transition in this, which, which you so nicely said, uh, we won't be able to go into it because we just don't have enough time. I need to actually wrap it up with our last uh, kind of a question, but it's a, it's a two part. Uh, and it's really for my listeners. Um, I, I want to encourage them to go to your websites. I want to go to your blog, to your medium, to, to that, to, to learn more, to also envelop and, and apply some of the things we've discussed, the sense making and, you know, looking at the bigger picture and, and how they can play an active role in that future, especially Gen Z. Um, and that is, I want you to depart two takeaways for our listeners, sustainable takeaways that they can apply um, to their lives that will help them make an impact, help them get further along, help them to maybe uh, um, apply and change the system or be a part in actively applying what uh, Sir Ken Robinson, what you, what we've discussed into their lives. And, and, and I want to and I want to set it up, maybe give you a little bit more help. And that is, um, what should young innovators in the field moving towards education or evangelism or innovation um, be thinking about um, if, if they want to make a real impact? That's one. The second one is, is what have um, you experienced or learned in your long journey and in your discussions and, and where you're still currently on the journey discovering um, that you would have loved to know from the start? Yeah, I think that, that there's a powerful question that I try and answer in, a, in a, as succinct way as possible. Um, so any, I think, any, I think any, anyone, particularly um, Gen Zs, um, that, that want to get involved in education, but I think really it's about change, about how do you affect change? And I think that in order to do that, I, I would recommend getting a really good understanding of um, how you know, societies form and you know, like understand some sociology, understand something about economics. Um, and, and obviously philosophy as well, but I, you know that sounds pretty dry, I guess, if you know to a Gen Z listener, oh really? But but you know it wasn't until I started looking at those things that I began to understand, you know, how th 
this all works, how it fits together. Because I think that this, you know, you really, I think it really, it's important to understand what system, what we mean by a system and what we mean by structure and structural change and structural reform. And until, I think until you get to grips with that, you end up going down lots of, of um, you know, blind alleys. I mean, you know, you, you know, I mean, I did, I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I, for lots of reasons, because it didn't work for me, I wanted to change education. And all I could think about was changing education, how wrong it was, how it didn't work. But I failed to understand why it was like it was. And I think that, you know, understanding that bit is important. And so in answer to the second part of your question is, I think that's the thing. I, I, I think that I wish, I mean, it's, it's hard. It's not, I mean, regretfully, I mean, you know, I've had a sort of the very strange, I think, uh, you know, career and life. I mean, it's only beginning to make sense. You know, life is like that, isn't it? It's lived forward and understood backwards. And, and I'm only going to understand more. I mean, I, I, it's so disparate. And people can find my CV. I mean, one minute music industry, one minute feature films, one minute, you know, the educate. How do I do all those things? And But it makes sense in, in, in my world. Um, but I think, that, you know, again, it would be like, I wish I'd understood a bit more. Uh, earlier on, and I don't know where that would have come from because it, 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 it wouldn't that it would still wouldn't have come from school, it wouldn't have come from university, you know, um, you know it's, it's I guess it's that thing, isn't it, about life? It's like you just real, suddenly realize you haven't got enough left. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it's 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 you know I'm probably you know more than halfway through it now, um, and it's it, it is a shame. It's like where does that go? It's like you know the, we I wish I you know. I wish I could do more, you know, I, you know, it's like, but it's taken me this long to know who I am. So maybe I had to do it. Okay, great. Uh, did, did you answer the second one as well? That was both of them wrapped up. Yeah, that was both wrapped up. I okay, think so. Great. It's like, cause I did, so it was like the, the, the point that young people should, if they want to, and I don't mean young people in a pejorative way, I mean, like, you know, if, if you're getting into this, is understanding what systems and, and uh, structure, structural things, I think, you know, what a structure is and, and, and how, the, how that operates, and then get that through sociology and, but, and economics. I know it sounds dry, but just to understand that economics is design. It's, it's a design of how societies operate. I think once you grasp that, then the changes you want to make, whether that's working in education or healthcare or food or whatever, it begin, if you want to affect change, it has to be at a system level. I mean, the, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, I'm a you know, passionate supporter. I mean, actually all of th those movements, I'm a passionate supporter of, of, of all of them. The thing was, is actually, you know, Black Lives Matter. I mean, I remember the first political rally I ever went to was, um, you know, when I was a, a young teenager in 1979, <laughs> it was the, uh, Rock Against Racism, Anti-Nazi League, uh, marched through London and ended with seeing the Clash uh, play at Victoria Park. It was amazing. At that time, we felt that we'd made a difference, you know, to the war, you know, because it was about racism and, and trying to, you know, get that out of society. But we hadn't. We didn't. Um, and because actually, the, if there's a structure, the society is, is already you know, built in, it's optimized, consciously or otherwise, to, to, to be racist, effectively. Um, you, then you don't really get lasting change. You might get some behavioral change for a while, but it soon dissipates. And we're seeing that now, of course. I mean, the kind of stuff which is now people feel able to say in public forum is just shocking. In one sense, I'm glad they're saying it because it proves we haven't done it. And I, I worry that, you know, that BLM or, or the other movements will feel that there's been some change because there's been some concessions, you know, maybe you will kill less people, uh, you know, but it, it's not the change that you want. We need a bigger change and, and, and that's going to be very tough. And in order to get that change, we're going to get a lot of pushback. But unless you understand what you're up against, it's very hard. I mean, you could end up, you know, I, ha I hate to say this with, with David Graeber just passing, you know, the Occupy movement, you know, it, it, it had that momentum, but didn't have a manifesto, didn't have a what we want. And that's in, my, in the early part of the conversation. If we want a different status quo, if we want a different one from what's happening at the moment, we have to unite and work out what our North Star is. 
and work out what that blueprint or, or, or design or that, that thing, because we have to have a credible alternative that, that everyone can get around. Every, you know, humans all over the planet can get around. If we don't have that, it'd be like Occupy. It, will get, you know, it was well-intentioned, but it didn't have that. Okay, well, you don't like that, but what do you like? How, you know, what, how do we get there? And that's the thing we've got to work on. And I think that's, you know, the, you know if I'm passing that back, from where I am now, what I've learned, it's that. It's like we have to work together to work that what that is. And you know, can we crowdsource that? You know, can you know, because I think it's this idea of, well, who's the leader? Maybe we have decentralized leadership. I mean, that was a that was a point around a number of things. I think it can work. We have the technologies to do that now. You know, we did think in the 90s that the internet and, and technology would liberate us. You know, we never imagined it would be used in the way it is now. I don't think the game's over. You know, I think that we can reclaim the internet. We can reclaim the conversation. And that, that's where I would, I would be. And, and from, uh, the second part of that was really, okay, well, you know, what would I go back and tell my, my younger self? It would be that. I mean, it was like, I wish I knew right. a bit of that, but, but as I say, I, you know, I only know that because of the experience I've had in my life. You know, it's frustrating, you know, on a time machine or something. That's fabulous. Thank you so much for those wisdoms. And, and that's something they can definitely learn. I always like to, to tell them uh, something, a good friend of mine, John P. Strelecki, he's written a couple of books. He always says, find the who, and it basically means find the mentor, find the who, the person who has done it, who has thought about it, who's written the book on it, who's, who's really trying to discover all they can about that you you are one of those people and i'm glad i found you to and Likewise. we met and that we could we could depart this wisdom because there's so many things that, uh, that can be gleaned from our discussion that can be put into practice to be applied and, and it's really great graham thank you so much for your time it's been a sheer pleasure and i hope we can do it again Next year on another podcast, get a catch up and, and have another deep dive. We're going to split this into two parts and, uh, and put all the links and everything in there. But it was so fabulous. Yeah, okay. thank, I mean, Mark, thank you. It's been actually wonderful um, seeing you again and having this conversation. And I hope it's not going to be a year before we have another one. No, it won't. I'll, I'll make sure it's soon. Thank you so Super much. Cool. Thank you so much. And thank you to your re uh, listeners for, for checking in. I appreciate it. Thanks.